We are carrying out a process known as redistricting. It's happening in my state and virtually every other state. Every 10 years following the decennial census. At this moment, state legislatures, county commissions, town councils are redrawing the lines that'll help determine the, uh, the American people, who the American people elect to resent, represent them in Congress and in their state capitals. That means for the first time since the days before Dr. King, King's March on Washington, congressional, state, and local government legislative districts will be drawn without the key protections of the Voting Rights Act. Because in 2013, the Supreme Court issued its 5-4 to four decision, Shelby County versus Holder. It essentially nullified a key provision of the Voting Rights Act of 65, Section 5. That Section 5 required localities with records of discrimination against voters of color through racist policies like poll taxes and literary tests to ensure any changes to their voting rules were vetted by the Justice Department before they could be enforced. This requirement is known simply as pre-clearance, and it applied to redistricting. But that pre-clearance requirement, the guarantee of accountability to the voters and adherence to the law, was eliminated by, eliminated by the Supreme Court in Shelby. As today's witness, Assistant Attorney General Kristen Clark has explained, in the absence of a pre-clearance requirement, jurisdictions have less incentive to involve community contacts in the elections process and the process of considering and adopting voting changes. Losing this avenue of participation is particularly harmful for minority voters. Americans have every reason to be concerned about the lack of transparency in this year's redistricting. Without full protections of the Voting Rights Act, state legislators could redraw districts in ways that are unlawfully diminish the power of voters of colors. And the truth is, state lawmakers have already taken unprecedented steps to silence the vo voices of American voters. This year alone, legislators throughout the country have introduced more than 425 bills with provisions to make it harder for people, particularly people of color, to vote. Nin 19 states have gone on to enact 33 of these laws. Some of them set new limits on voting by mail. Others cut hours on polling locations. All of them are designed to achieve the same outcome new barriers to the ballot box. The proponents of these laws claim they are designed to help prevent so-called voter fraud, but facts show that claims of voter fraud are nothing more than grist for the mill of the big lie. Remember when the former president insisted that he actually won the election last year? He's still at it. That election was branded by the depart his de Department of Homeland Security as the most secure in American history. Earlier this month, a team of Republican-backed, quote, cyber ninjas, that's what they call themselves, completed a months-long audit. They collected millions of dollars from right-wing organizations to fund this undertaking. This was going to be a months-long audit of the 2020 election results in Arizona to prove once and for all that Donald Trump finally won. What did they find? More votes for Joe Biden and fewer votes for Donald Trump. Despite this overwhelming evidence, the myth of voter fraud persists. Sadly, it's being weaponized by those who hope to advance their own political ambitions by discrediting our electoral process. So if state legislators and others are going to defame and diminish our democracy, we in the Congress have a duty to defend it. With the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, the Senate has an opportunity to reinvigorate one of the most important pieces of legislation in American history. I've been here a few years. I can actually remember, and I'll bet Senator Leahy could too, this was a big bipartisan issue. Over the years, Democrats and Republicans voted the same way on the Voting Rights Act. In the words of Senator Mitch McConnell, quote, when he voted for it once, this is a piece of legislation which has worked. I think he's right. Let's keep it working. In our nation, there is no freedom more fundamental than the right to vote. And as our old friend John Lewis said before his passing, it's the most powerful nonviolent tool we have. Our democracy is strongest when every eligible voter votes. I'll now turn to Senator Leahy, the lead sponsor of the John Lewis. Oh, I'm sorry. First, it looks like I'm going to turn to my friend, <laughs> Senator Chuck Grassley, and then Patrick Leahy. Uh, Senator Grassley, I'm sorry. H.R. 4 was crafted in the memory of the late Congressman John L. John Lewis and... It's about voting rights, 
that he fought for and properly honored for. The unfortunate reality is that this hearing is another attack on the Supreme Court, and this bill is yet another attempt at federal takeover of state and local elections. It wrestles control of elections away from the state and into the hands of the Biden-Harris Department of Justice and partisan lawyers backed by dark money groups. Before discussing the matter at hand, I want to say that we're grateful to have a number of extraordinary busy state officials and former state and federal officials we heard from who were eager to testify against this bill. This was even more impressive for this hearing given that the second panel was unsettled until just last Friday. We truly appreciate all their efforts and their outreach. Revising and reviewing this bill, I can see why so many experts were willing to rearrange their schedules. This bill is a disaster. It penalizes states for voter ID laws, which an overwhelming majority of Americans support. Even Democrats claim to support ID laws earlier this year. It fundamentally changes who is responsible for elections in America, replacing states with the federal government. Why change what has worked for 240 years in which the Constitution is very clear that the manner of holding elections is up to state legislatures. This is the fourth hearing regarding voting rights in the United States Senate this Congress. We had a subcommittee hearing two weeks ago on the same topic, but this did not seem like a process de designed to learn more from the experts and state officials responsible for running elections. It seemed rushed so that we could say that we had another hearing. Look at this bill's history. This bill has been proposed in various names and with slightly different provisions all the way back to 2015. It was proposed in direct response to the Supreme Court's 2013 decision, Shelby County. That case recognized that the landscape in America looked very different in 2013 than in 1965 when the Voting Rights Act was passed and the Supreme Court concluded that Congress couldn't keep requiring states to pre-clear with the federal government election law changes based on data going back to 1965. Fast forward then eight years and the Supreme Court again issued a decision, this time the Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee. This case, the Supreme Court set forth a list of substantive guideposts to determine whether, considering the totality of the circumstances, changes to voting rules are lawful under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Unsurprisingly, Democrats immediately set about revising this bill to overrule the Supreme Court's common sense decision. The latest version doesn't just revive the pre-clearance procedures in place before Shelby County, it massively expands pre-clearance. Democrats also want to erase the very reasonable factors that the court outlined in Brnovich to guide lower courts as they look at the totality of circumstances for changes to voting laws. H.R. 4 replaces those Supreme Court guideposts with a list of undefined and far more vague factors, such as difficulty complying with voting requirements. These factors don't provide any legal clarity. What they do provide is enormous opportunity for mischief by Democrat lawyers. If the activist lawyers, backed by an unending flow of dark money, can find a few violations under this amorphous standard, then a state is subject to preclearance. That gives DOJ control over jurisdiction for a period of 10 years. As written, H.R. 4 would also give the Department of Justice the power to 
retroactively look back at a jurisdiction, determine whether in the past 25 years the jurisdiction has sufficient number of violations to warrant imposing preclearance pre uh, right now. Preclearance worked wonders in 1965. It was needed to ensure the vote for minority communities that were denied the right to vote by poll taxes and literary, literacy tests. Those laws have thankfully been erased from the books. We have recently had record turnout for minority voters. So why are we expanding preclearance in 2021? Do we really want the Department of Justice exerting this level of control over our states? This is the same DOJ that only yesterday distributed a memorandum vaguely threatening to use the FBI to investigate parents protesting school teaching critical race theory in the classroom if those protests, quote unquote, intimidate school board members? Do we really want to give partisan activists who claim that paying for postage stamps to mail in a ballot is a poll tax, the ability to subject a state to burdensome uh, federal regulations and oversight? Do we really want to give Democratic operatives unfettered power to bring states under preclearance with lawsuits Lawsuits resting on vague notions of quote unquote violations. To that end, I hope to hear from Attorney General Okita, who was previously Indiana's Secretary of State, why it's so important for states to manage their own elections. And while federalized election laws are bad for election integrity and most importantly, voter participation, I hope to hear from the Honorable Ken. Co Kuchish Ellie, who uh, was the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia when preclearance was outlawed, the impact of imposing preclearance procedures would have moving forward. Now, before I wrap up, I'd like to take a moment to introduce, for the record, two written statements that I believe warrant recognition. Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson described the flaws in H.R. 4 and noted that, quote, this legislation is nothing more than an attempt to ensure that one party control the machinery of our government in perpetuity by mandating an unconstitutional federal takeover of elections in our country, end of quote. I also appreciate that a legal advisor to the bipartisan Carter Baker Commission, uh, Thorn Hearn, noted that H.R. 4 is, the quote, the antithesis of the Carter Baker Commission's bipartisan recommendations for election reform, end of quote. We would be wise to heed their concerns with regard to H.R. Forbes. So sadly, my Democrat friends seem to disagree. They're pushing H.R. 4 to take away the ability of states to establish their own voting rules. We should all agree that participating in American democracy at the ballot box is a fundamental right. It's a right that we should want to protect and not outsource to political operatives in DOJ and activists outside groups. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Leahy. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know that uh, my friend Kansas, Senator Grassley, was talking about H.R. 4, but I, I would no, Tim, we're, we're, we're here to discuss my bill, uh, S-4, which has dramatic changes from the bill he was talking about. It's the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I've championed this for years. Uh, the Voting Rights Advancement Act, as you've noted, Mr. Chairman, has been bipartisan for many years, just like all the efforts to restore the Voting Rights Act uh, before it. I hope it continues to get bipartisan support, as it has always had. Uh, like the evolving decisions from the court that impact the Voting Rights Act, well, then this legislation also must evolve to address emerging concerns. It may be surprising to some when they hear the rhetoric to learn that the Voting Rights Act improving and strengthening and reauthorizing it has been 
an overwhelming bipartisan effort for decades. We seem to be in an era of toxic partisanship, and I hope that will not obscure what has for decades united us across party lines. Republican and Democrat members of this committee, of this committee, voted in support of reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act in 2006. In fact, it wasn't long ago. We stood side by side to unanimously approve the 2006 reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. We even stood together, the House and Senate members, Republicans and Democrats alike, on the steps of the Capitol. And you have about as broad a spectrum of ideologies uh, um, among the Republicans and Democrats in that picture as you can imagine. So I wonder what's changed in such a short time. The belief that protecting our right to vote is bigger than party or politics, that's not novel or new. And in my state of Vermont, we fight to make sure everybody has a chance to vote. It's a belief that a system of self-government, a government of, by, and for the people, is one that is worth preserving for generations to come. And that's why the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is here. It seeks to ensure that Americans of all parties, all races, all backgrounds, they have the right to vote protected. It's not, nor has it ever been, an effort to empower one party over the other. You know, we insist on all people being able to vote in Vermont. It's not for one party or the other. In the last election, we elected a Republican governor, elected a Democrat lieutenant governor. It's not about a federal takeover of elections. It's not about empowering fraudulent voting. It's about empowering citizens to fulfill their constitutional duty and exercise their legal right to vote. And we as elected representatives of the people I'd be able to agree that that's a right worth protecting. So the legislation I introduced yesterday is the culmination of many months of negotiation, both here in the Senate and the House, and consultation with the Department of Justice. And I couldn't help but think that's the sort of process Congressman Lewis would have embraced. The Supreme Court Shelby County decision decreed that Congress has to build a fulsome record of current voting conditions and then premise any legislation restoring the Voting Rights Act on that record. Well, we've methodically, for years, done just that. So what does that record show? It demonstrates action from Congress is needed and demanded to defend against efforts to restrict the right to vote in states across the country. The House answered that call. They passed a bold version of the John Lewis VRA this summer. We did our part by introducing a Senate version that stayed true to the goals of the House passed legislation and incorporated input we've received through ongoing bipartisan conversation. So I, I, this shouldn't be a partisan issue. It never has been, not in all my years here in the Senate. And I'll continue working in good faith with senators of both parties to find common ground. Remember, we have one thing that goes beyond Democrats or Republicans, and that's protecting our precious right to vote. That's what gives democracy its name. That's more important than any party. Every one of us should recognize the sacrifices of people like our friend and hero, John Lewis. The question is, are we willing to live up to his example, put aside our differences, and do what's right for democracy? I know we can the question is, do we have the will to try? I hope we do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Thanks Senator Leahy. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The hearings that Democrats decide to hold demonstrate their priorities, what they care about. We have a crisis raging on our southern border right now because of Joe Biden's lawless and open border policies. The head of the Biden Department of Homeland Security is informing its staff to prepare for up to 400,000 illegal immigrants crossing this month. And yet the Senate Judiciary Committee has not had a single hearing on the crisis on our southern border. Over 2 million illegal immigrants streaming into America, Democrats don't care. 
hundreds of thousands of kids in cages. Democrats don't care. Every Democrat on this committee went on TV on and on about kids in cages, kids in cages. You now know what they were saying they didn't believe, because if they believed it, there are more kids in more cages that are more full now than there ever were, and not a Democrat on this committee cares. Hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants with COVID. Democrats don't care. Children by the thousands being physically and sexually abused by human traffickers. Democrats don't care. Drugs streaming across our border. Democrats don't care. Young women being trapped in sexual slavery by human traffickers. Democrats don't care. Well, what do they care about? Well, this illustrates what they care about. Democrats have one priority, and that is power, staying in power. That's why Democrats have had four hearings on amnesty. They look at two million illegal immigrants, and they think, ooh, future Democratic voters, let's give them all amnesty. Never mind the abuses that happen. This is about power for our Democratic friends. But you know what? They, there's something they've had more hearings on than amnesty, and that is the federal takeover of, of election law, and the democratic power grab. There is nothing that is a higher priority for Democrats than staying in power. The Corrupt Politicians Act was so brazenly political, it was such a naked power grab, that Democrats have abandoned it where they realized they couldn't defend it with a straight face. So this is their fallback prov provision. Senator Leahy mentioned his version of the bill in the Senate, that was filed at 1245 last night is when committee members were notified of it. And there are a lot of terrible provisions in the bill, but let me just cover two briefly. Department of Justice preclearance for everyone Democrats don't like, and Department of Justice preclearance for everything Democrats don't like. Here's, here's how it would work. Every state and local government across the country would have to submit certain voting changes. What voting changes? Well, anything like imposing voter ID on elections or preventing ballot harvesting to Kristen Clark and Vanita Gupta, two partisan activists who haven't been shy about their hatred of voter integrity laws before those changes can go into effect. All right, spoiler alert. If it is a law protecting the integrity of the election, if it's a voter ID law, if it's prohibiting balloted harvesting, the partisan activists at the Department of Justice are going to object because they've been explicit they oppose all those laws. Similarly, any state and local government that the Democrats don't like, they have to submit every voting change to the same part partisan activists. Let me give you an example of how crazy this is just by analogy. Can you imagine if Republicans proposed a law that said that states like California and New York and Illinois have to submit every law or policy affecting religious liberty or affecting firearms to a brand new division of the Department of Justice staffed almost entirely by activists who've been fighting in favor of religious liberty and in favor of the Second Amendment their entire time? And if these activists objected to the California or New York law, then the states couldn't implement them. That would be absurd. That's what the Democrats have done. And ironically, the Democrats claim they're protecting the right to vote. This bill is an assault on the right to vote. Why? Number one, ballot integrity acts like voter ID acts prevent voter fraud. Sadly, Democrats have looked at the bipartisan Carter Baker provision shared by former Democratic President Jimmy Carter, and just about every recommendation on how to prevent voter fraud, they've turned on its head and said, we want more fraud because fraud benefits Democrats. But secondly, the laws that they want unelected bureaucrats to strike down are laws adopted by democratically elected legislatures in the states. You don't get to claim, as Senate Democrats do, that you favor democracy when you propose measures to stop democracy. Democracy means the voters decide. This bill is an assault on democracy because it says we don't care that 29 million people in the state of Texas decide we want voter ID 
in accordance with the views of 80% of Americans. We don't care. One unelected bureaucrat at the Department of Justice who happens to be a radical left-wing Democratic activist has the power to say to hell with democracy, we're striking down laws passed by democratically elected legislatures. This is a power grab, it's cynical, and it's wrong. We will now turn to the first panel. On our first panel, we welcome the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Kristen Clark, back to the committee. Assistant Attorney General Clark is a lifelong civil rights lawyer, spent her entire career in public service. At the Justice Department, she oversees federal civil rights enforcement efforts and works to uphold civil and constitutional rights. She first began a career as a trial lawyer in the Civil Rights Division. Before her confirmation to her current role, she served as President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Let me lay out the mechanics for the rest of the hearing. After we swear in the Assistant Attorney General, she'll have five minutes for an opening statement, then rounds of questions, and I hope each senator will abide by our standard to try to keep their questions to five minutes or less, as we have some roll call votes, which will call some senators out of the committee from time to time. Following that, we will switch to our second panel, and Senator Ossoff will take over presiding. We will once again have five-minute opening statements from each witness and five minutes of questions per senator. Assistant Attorney General Clark, could you please stand to be sworn in? If you'd raise your right hand. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee? You believe the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Let the record reflect that she answered in the affirmative. Please, please proceed with your opening statement. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, my name is Kristen Clark, and I serve as the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Department's work to implement and enforce the Voting Rights Act and the need to revitalize and restore the Act. The Voting Rights Act is, as President Johnson said, one of the most monumental laws in the entire history of American freedom. It is a law that has helped to truly transform American democracy. However, the progress we have made is fragile. Recently, there's been a resurgence in attacks on voting rights, including cuts to early voting periods, burdensome restrictions to register or vote, racially gerrymandered redistricting plans, polling sites eliminated or consolidated in communities of color, eligible voters purged from the rolls, and more. I am here today to sound an alarm. For the Justice Department, restoring and strengthening the Voting Rights, is, the Voting Rights Act is a matter of great urgency. The Supreme Court's 2013 Shelby County versus Holder ruling suspended the preclearance process, eliminating the Justice Department's single most powerful and effective tool for protecting the right to vote. Before Shelby, the preclearance process enabled the department to swiftly block the implementation of many discriminatory and unconstitutional voting practices. Through Section 5, the department blocked over 3,000 voting changes, helping protect the rights of millions of citizens. In over 60% of blocked voting changes, there was evidence of intentional discrimination. We also know that the preclearance requirement deterred many jurisdictions from adopting discriminatory changes in the first place. Too many jurisdictions have viewed the Shelby ruling as an invitation to adop adopt rules that disadvantage minority voters. Today, jurisdictions that want to restrict voting rights have what the Supreme Court memorably described the advantage of time and inertia. These new laws can be challenged only through long, protracted, resource-intensive, case-by-case litigation, which we have pursued in states like Texas and North Carolina. We are on the cusp of, of another potentially transformational moment. A new redistricting cycle has commenced. 2020 census numbers show the U.S. has become an increasingly diverse nation with population growth attributable to increases in the number of people of color. Absent congressional action, this redistricting cycle would be the first in half a century 
without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act, and jurisdictions may be poised to dilute the increased minority voting strength that has resulted from these natural demographic changes. Without preclearance, the Justice Department will have limited tools to obtain documents and to assess where voting rights are being restricted, thereby hampering enforcement efforts. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act addresses several of the barriers I've referenced, which are impeding the department's efforts to protect American citizens' right to vote. First, the act responds to the elimination of the preclearance coverage formula by updating the relevant criteria so that Section 5 coverage is tied to current conduct by jurisdictions. Second, the bill provides greater clarity regarding the appropriate legal standard in Section 2 vote denial cases. Third, the legislation gives the department authority to compel the production of documents and materials relevant to investigations of potential voting rights violations. And fourth, the bill places uh, new measures uh, to safeguard the rights of Native American and Alaskan Native voters. In 1965, Congress enacted, and in 1975, 1982, and 2006 reauthorized a statute that provided the strong medicine needed to remedy voting discrimination and to enforce our Constitution's commitment to ensuring that no citizen's right to vote would be abridged on account of race or color. Congress must act now to restore the Voting Rights Act to prevent us from backsliding into a nation where millions of citizens, particularly citizens of color, find it difficult to register, cast their ballot, and elect candidates of their choice. The Justice Department welcomes this opportunity to work with Congress to revive this bedrock civil rights law. Thank you. Thanks, uh, General Clark. Let me uh, start the questioning. Texas is the largest legislature, pardon me, the latest legislature this year to attack the right to vote based on the lie of widespread voter fraud. Last month, Texas Governor Abbott signed SB1 into law. It banned, it banned voting opportunities that made voting more accessible, particularly during the pandemic, such as drive-through voting and 24-hour voting options. It increased access for partisan poll watchers. It prohibited local election officials from proactively distributing applications to request mail-in ballots. The legislation also restricts the state's vote-by-mail access, including new ID requirements for absentee voters. These voting restrictions come after voters of color used all of these same options at historic levels in the last election. Now, supporters of the bill, and we've heard it this afternoon in the committee, claim you've got to do it. It's the only way to stop voter fraud. So the Texas Attorney General spent 22,000 hours looking for evidence of fraud. You'd think they really would have made their case. What they found to try to justify SB1 was the following. Only 16 potential cases of fraud out of 17 million registered voters. And you remember what happened in Arizona. 5.7 million spent on the Ninja Turtles who were going through all these ballots. And the net result was more votes for Biden, fewer votes for Trump. So this notion of voter fraud is a ruse as far as I'm concerned. Where there is fraud and waste, we should oppose it, whatever party is trying to make an excuse for it. But in this case, there is no basis for it. I would like to ask you to put into perspective for just a moment. We know the discrimination based on voting throughout history. It's a horrible chapter, more than one chapter, in our nation's uh, history when it comes to civil rights after the Civil War. The question today is, does it take on a different context in light of the big lie, in light of the argument of the previous president that he, in fact, won the last election, though there's no evidence of that, and the attempt to discredit our electoral and voting process? Uh, thank you for the question, Chairman. Uh, the Justice Department believes that elections in our country should be open, fair, and free from fraud. We uh, have observed that claims of fraud are exceedingly rare. Should the Justice Department encounter evidence of fraud, the department stands ready to investigate uh, that fraud. 
But what the Justice Department has observed is that uh, voting discrimination is widespread. It is a current day problem across our country, in Texas and in many other parts of the country. Uh, the Justice Department spent several years tackling the state's voter ID law. Uh, we know that the state of Texas spent about $3.5 million defending that law. The Justice Department is here to make the case for restoring the preclearance provisions so that we can ensure that elections are free, open, and fair across our country. It seems when you read Shelby County and Bornovich that the argument being made by the Supreme Court is, sure, it was a problem in the old days, but it's just no longer a problem that would require preclearance. And yet you look back not that far in history. A three-judge panel in 2016 examining a 2013, 2013 North Carolina voting law that required strict voter ID, voter ID and limited early voting. The judges wrote, quote, targeted Amer African Americans with almost surgical pres precision. This was no coincidence, the court found noting that before enacting the law, the legislature requests data on the use by race of a number of voting practices. Upon receipt of the race data, the General Assembly enacted legislation that restricted voting and registration in five different ways, all of which disproportionately affect African Americans. That's eight years ago. And the question I have for you, is there evidence now of what we're seeing in the states of recurrence of this theme? Um, yes, in the department's view, voting discrimination is a current day problem. Uh, the Justice Department has found that Section 2 litigation, which it brought in the states that you referenced, North Carolina and Texas, have proven to be an inadequate substitute for the important protections that had long been provided by Section 5. The advantage with Section 5 is that it blocks these discriminatory laws from ever taking root in our electoral process. While the department had Section 5 in place, uh, the department blocked 3,000 discriminatory voting changes, about 60% of them uh, having evidence of intentional discrimination. Our hope is that these hearings will lead to a restoration of what has been one of the most important and powerful tools for the department to do its work of safeguarding uh, the right to vote in our country. Thank you. Senator Grassley. Yes. Uh, General Clark, I'm going to quote some polls that you probably know exist, but I'm going to quote them anyway. Monmouth, 84% of non-white respondents said that they supported requiring vote, photo ID. 62% of the Democrats said they supported requiring photo ID. Uh, that number rose to 87% among independents, 91% among Republicans. So two questions for you. How do you square prevailing public sentiment with your comments that photo ID is a burdensome proof of citizenship required, and your words, a bag of trips to suppress black votes. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Grassley. The department does not believe that voter ID laws on their face are uh, unlawful. The department carries out its work by looking at the particular photo ID law that may have been adopted in a particular state. It looks at data with the support of experts to determine who has access to the particular forms of ID that are deemed qualifying under a particular law. We, we follow the facts and apply the law. Uh, photo ID laws are not uh, on their face invalid. It really de depends on where uh, that photo ID law has been instituted. It depends on the form of the ID and the kinds of ID uh, that may be permissible on that law and whether or not there are disparities in who has access to the particular uh, category of IDs called for by a law. Uh the overwhelming majority of Americans, as accord, according to this polls, support ID requirements. So do you think most Americans support, uh, voter, support voter suppression because you said it would suppress black votes? Um, well, the department believes that our elections should be free from discrimination and particular photo ID laws or purge programs or decisions to shut down polling sites 
may have a discriminatory impact on minority voters. And what we have found in the course of uh, our work at the department is that it, these are fact-specific, uh, uh, fact-intensive and context-specific inquiries, uh, Senator. Uh, these kinds of analyses are conducted by the career employees at the department who will look at a, a particular law, a particular photo ID law, to determine whether or not it runs afoul of the Voting Rights Act or the Constitution. You, you gave me a department answer, and, and uh, that's appropriate, but my question is whether you think uh, these ID requirements uh, that because Americans say they're for them and you say they're a way of suppressing black votes, do you think Americans support voter suppression? Um, well, well, Senator, um, I think that these polls are helpful, but the department conducts its work by looking at the facts okay, and, that, and applying that, the law. Let me go on to another question. The Department of Justice recently filed a lawsuit against Georgia's election reforms. Will the Department of Justice bring enforcement action against New York for only allowing 10 days of in-person voting, or Delaware for never permitting early in-person voting? Uh, so if you, if you say no to that, uh, if you don't plan to bring an action, then how can you challenge Georgia's uh, uh, Senate vote, uh, Senate vote? Bill 202, which has more lenient provisions than both New York and Delaware. Um, uh, Senator, I can't comment on pending investigations uh, and if any such investigation exists, but what I can tell you is that the department is committed to protecting the right to vote in every corner of our country. In New York, for example, we recently resolved a matter involving a county that ran afoul of the National Voter Registration Act and the Help America Vote Act. Uh, we're committed to eliminating discrimination root and branch wherever it rears its head across our country. I was very gratified to see that the 2020 presidential election, despite the pandemics, quote, featured the largest increase in voters between two presidential elections on the record with 17 million more people voting than in 2016, uh, end of quote. Additionally, in 2020, non-Hispanic blacks had a higher voting turnout than in 2016, 63% as compared to 60%. It would seem to me that we should be encouraging these high turnouts without restrictions. What about these statistics justify the imposition of preclearance. Uh, thank, thank you, Senator. Uh, the statistics that you share certainly reflect a story of progress. But what the department has found that is that in particular communities across our country, voting discrimination remains a real and ongoing problem. Uh, we saw this in Texas and North Carolina where the department uh, was engaged in long-standing uh, Section 2 litigation against discriminatory measures in those places. And we saw this recently in New York in the uh, matter that I referenced involving violations of HAVA and the NVRA. We saw this in New Jersey uh, where we recently resolved a statewide NVRA claim. Uh, so while there has been progress, we know that voting discrimination remains alive and well in many uh, local, state, uh, uh, and jurisdiction, other jurisdictions across the country, and Section 5 has proven to be an important tool to identify and, and block voting discrimination. Uh, th thank you. I, um, I have a couple questions, and as you know, some of us have been running in, in and out uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, do we have an order so that we will know when we're in the queue? Senator Blackburn here. No, I, I know who you are. We've met before. <laughs> no, yeah. I was just asking if well, we had the, an order uh, in the queue. Well, the Republican side would okay. determine who you they got. Okay, to thanks. Have. Um, the, if we go by order of arrival, of course, Senator Durbin and I and Senator Grassley, the three ahead, here ahead of everybody else, but um, what, so if we can start my time over again, 
The uh, Assistant Attorney General Clark, I am glad you're here. I think this is um, important that we all be here. As the lead sponsor of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, I'm alarmed by the toxic and partisan rhetoric around restoring the Voting Rights Act. As a child, I remember going in the, my parents, when they would go to vote, and they were, they told me this is a sacred right, everybody should have it. And for decades, since I've been here in the Senate, Republicans and Democrats come, came together to strengthen this landmark law. And so I can't understand the partisan rancor that's going around with it now. So why is it so important for Americans of all parties, all backgrounds, to believe that this issue should unite us, not divide us? Thank you uh, for that question, Senator. Uh, the right to vote is one of the most central rights in American democracy. And we know that uh, the Voting Rights Act has enjoyed tremendous bipartisan support throughout the years during its authorization in 1965, during subsequent reauthorizations in, in uh, uh, 1970, uh, 1982, and 2006. And I am recalling the statement that President Bush made when he signed the bill into law in 2006. He observed that he was a renew renewing a bill that helped to bring com a community on the margins into the life of American democracy. The Justice Department knows that partisanship has no place uh, when it's come to enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. This work has been about ensuring that all Americans enjoy equal access to the ballot, uh, regardless of race, that all Americans enjoy an electoral process that is free from discrimination. Uh, the Justice Department welcomes this opportunity to work with Congress now to restore a law that truly has proven to be one of the most effective laws ever passed by Congress. Well, I, you know, for those of us, and I know you do and I do, believe that everybody should be, have the right to vote, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, whoever they are, we're going to preserve a democracy. Uh, some would say this is a, and some have claimed, even from this committee, there's some kind of a nefarious attempt by Democrats to usurp states' rights and sovereignty. Uh, if so, I would, nobody in my state would allow me to vote for it. Uh, it nothing could be further from the truth. So can you explain in simple terms why the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is a balanced approach, and the safeguards are included in the legislation to ensure that states have ample opportunity to assert their rights and defend their procedures? Uh, well, uh, the department has observed a number of important features about this bill. It makes bailout easier so that jurisdictions that have a clean record and a clean bill of health can exempt themselves from the preclearance obligation. Uh, we observe that there are states throughout time, such as North Carolina and Mississippi, that joined an amicus brief in the Shelby case who indicated they enjoyed the benefits of preclearance, that they appreciated the flexibility and latitude that the process provided. The career employees at the Justice Department who uh, handle the preclearance process have had good working relationships with local and state election officials. Jurisdictions also have the option of bypassing the Justice Department and going to the courts for judicial uh, review instead. Uh, but there's been a long history of good collaboration between the Justice Department and local and state jurisdictions in uh, administering the preclearance process. This is a process that has, at the end of the day, helped to block voting discrimination uh, and, and, and has helped to rid discrimination from our electoral process. Thank you. Well, I hope we can continue to work together on this to make sure we can find a path to enactment. I, I'm including in the record now the House Judiciary Committee's record addressing voting rights and the Voting Rights Act of the Senate Judiciary Committee record, and without objection, that will be included. Mm -hmm. Continue to work with us because... <clears throat> 
I was thrilled to be standing with leading, uh, if I could have that photograph back just for a moment, and I'll yield the floor. I, I was thrilled to be standing with leading Republicans and Democrats when we uh, last signed this bill and saying, see, it's for America. It's not for either political party. It's for America. And that's what we want. Um, now to answer Senator Blackburn's question, actually, Senator, I'm told Senator Lee uh, will be recognized and Senator Klobuchar, Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Clark, I, let's talk for a minute about um, what states can do. Uh, does, does California have the authority and should it have the authority to adopt more stringent air quality standards uh, than the federal standards in place without receiving preclearance from the United States government? Uh, Senator, I, I, this is not an area that I work in, uh, I, I suppose, but I, this is not an area that I work in. Yeah, what about areas that are protected by the Bill of Rights? Um, let's suppose that a, a state wants to pass laws dealing with COVID-19 that might have the impact of restricting religious freedom by, for example, uh, restricting the number of people who may congregate in a church or otherwise. Should laws like that have to first receive preclearance before they can be enacted by a state? Um, well, Senator, I'm, I'm here to talk about the right to vote, which falls to the 14th and 15th Amendments, and Congress has broad sure. powers to uh, sure. In, in sure. enforce. And, and uh, I assume you'd also agree that through the 14th Amendment, Congress also has broad powers to protect other fundamental individual rights, including religious freedom. What about, what about uh, the Second Amendment? What about gun laws? Should a state be required to receive preclearance from federal officials before adopting gun restrictions? Um, th this is not an area that I work in in the Civil Rights Division, but I do know that the right to vote is unique. It's special, and it's something that the Supreme Court has routinely said that Congress has broad enforcement powers under the 14th and 15th Amendments to protect. Sure, and, and those, those broad powers also extend uh, to other rights that people have. Now, I, I think that it's important for us to remember that our nation is built on this principle of, of respect for the sovereign entities that our states are and for the ability of each sovereign state, uh, for the people, uh, through their elected representatives, to be able to adopt laws that they deem fit. Because, of course, the sovereigns in our republic are, in fact, the people. And the people have yielded some of their sovereignty up to the states. In other areas, they've yielded it to the federal sovereign. The Supreme Court of the United States has made this very clear in a, a number of cases over the years, in, including um, the, the Supreme Court ruling in the Shelby County case, in which the Supreme Court of the United States said, quote, the federal government does not have a general right to review and veto state enactments before they go into effect. In fact, the Founding Fathers considered and expressly, decidedly rejected uh, giving the federal government the power to provide what they refer to as a negative or, or a, a veto over any and all state laws. So we don't advocate for preclearance even in areas surrounding our constitutional rights and the constitutional rights belonging to individuals. You know, if the laws passed by a state happen to violate the Constitution, we do, of course, have a procedure in place for challenging those. Uh, they go to the federal judiciary. You know, the parties can litigate those. After, of course, the constitutional arguments are, are made to the legislative body considering them. If they fail there, they can raise them with the judiciary after they become law. Um, and so we've got to be very careful that we don't neglect this principle of federalism in our lawmaking processes. And we can't do this here. We can't uh, sacrifice this principle.
uh, even for rights that we consider important, because the sovereignty of the people is also important. But there again, if the states do something unconstitutional, their enactments can be deemed unconstitutional, and their, the enforcement of those laws and their implementation can be enjoined. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we've had a number of politicians, including some progressives, who aren't satisfied with merely dictating voting procedures to the states. In fact, then-Senator Kamala Harris in 2019 proposed using preclearance to usurp state control over regulations involving health, safety, and welfare situations arising in the context of abortion. Ms. Clark, when I, when I hear from you, your remarks and your testimony, um, and one of the things that I hear from you is that the average American's concern about the integrity of our elections is somehow based in racism. Fortunately, the, the facts don't, don't support that premise. Now, progressives have tried to label any integrity election protection procedure, uh, such as the laws uh, that have been passed, for example, in Georgia of late, as somehow amounting to racist voter suppression. And yet, these provisions have strong support from voters across the political spectrum, including among minority voters. So can you tell me, Ms. Clark, uh, what exactly is racist about requiring a person to provide <clears throat> voter ID when participating in the, the precious, sacred, constitutionally protected process of voting? Um, thank you, Senator. So the inquiry is whether or not a particular law is discriminatory. And we won't know that until we actually look at the facts. We look at the particular law at issue. And we look at where is it being applied? And are there racial disparities in terms of who has access to example to the limited forms of ID that might be called for by a law? So I think the, the inquiry is about discriminatory effect and discriminatory purpose. And, and I, I would note that the senator has gone considerably over his time. I didn't want to interrupt him, but uh, I'll turn to Senator Klobuchar. And I do that because we're having votes going on and people are trying to go back and forth. Thank you, Mr. Senator Chair. Klobuchar. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for being here today, Ms. Clark. I just want to get some basic facts here. In the Supreme Court's 5-4 decision in Shelby County v. Holder, the majority wrote that when Congress establishes a process for preclearance, it must do so in a way, and this is the court decision, that makes sense in light of current conditions. It cannot rely simply on the past. How do the updates to the Voting Rights Act in the John Lewis Bill respond to the Supreme Court's critique? And do you agree that it's relevant to our evaluation of current conditions that this year alone over 400 bills have been introduced across the country to roll back voting rights and at least 31 of them have been signed into law? Um, thank you, Senator. So the bill does a number of things. It tethers the preclearance formula to current conditions, which, as you note, is the instruction from the Supreme Court in the Shelby ruling. And I also deem these hearings that Congress has been conducting since at least 2019 to be important because they've provided an opportunity for Congress to hear about those current conditions on the ground across the country. Um, the, rule, the, the bill also provides stronger protections for Native American and Alaskan Native uh, voters, which uh, is important, and does a number of other things, including clarifying the standards to be applied in Section 2 vote denial cases and more. Thank you very much. Um, uh, do you agree, and I know you're familiar with the Freedom to Vote Act, and we know that John Lewis Bill, let me just stop back, will stop states with a history of racial discrimination from rolling back voting rights in the future. It would also counteract some of the laws that states have already passed through a new provision in Section 2 that would apply to changes in voting laws made this year. But do you agree that in order to protect Americans' vote to right to vote, Congress must pass both the John Lewis Bill and the Freedom to Vote Act, which, as you know, is a negotiation. Senator Manchin and myself and Senator Padilla on this committee, Senator Warnock, Senator Merkley, Senator Kane and King, and Senator Schumer um, put together. Thank you, Senator. Um, the department is here to speak to the importance of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act today and welcomes the opportunity to work with Congress on other ways and other bills that might strengthen uh, voting rights in our country. 
All right, I was listening to um, Senator Lee's questions, and it made me think of my own real-world experience here going down to Georgia. I took the Rules Committee, which I chair uh, to Georgia for a field hearing, our first one in decades, about its new voting law, which includes egregious provisions, which is why major companies have come out against it, uh, like reducing the number and availability of ballot drop boxes, boxes putting new limits on early voting, um, allowing politicians to fire local election officials, changing the time of the runoff to 28 days and that not voting, allowing for any weekend voting during that time period, making voters put their birth date on the outside of the envelope that's the internal envelope instead of the day they cast the ballot, which is meant to sow confusion, not allowing for registration during the runoff period. What is the impact of laws like the one in Georgia on voter participation, especially among voters of color in both urban and rural areas? Um, well, Senator, the department has pending litigation um, against the state of Georgia, and so I can't comment on pending litigation. But what I can say is that the case-by-case -case work that the department has been engaged in uh, has not been an adequate substitute for the important uh, work that we've been able to do when we had Section 5 in place, blocking uh, thousands of discriminatory voting changes from ever taking root in the country. Very good. Finally, uh, Congressman John Lewis called voting the most powerful nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. And that's how I see it. I have a state that uh, has the highest voter turnout nearly every single election, including the last one. And honestly, uh, Mr. Chairman, with voting laws that allow for things like same-day registration. Um, we have elected Democratic governors, uh, like our governor, Tim Walls, Republican governors, like Tim Pawlenty, and independent governors, like Jesse Ventura. I just see the difference. It's not what party gets elected. The change is that people feel like they're part of the franchise and that we're making it easier for them to vote. Why is it important, Ms. Clark, to strengthen and restore the Voting Rights Act, particularly after several Supreme Court decisions have rolled back the Justice Department's ability to enforce the law's protection? Um, Senator, the right to vote is one of the most important civil rights in our country. It is the right from which other civil rights are derived. And it speaks to principles that lie at the heart of our Constitution. And we know that the Constitution vests this body with broad powers under the 14th and 15th Amendment to ensure that our elections are free from racial discrimination. And we welcome this opportunity to work with you and other members of the committee, committee to achieve that goal. Thank you very much. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Clark, you're in charge of policing the Civil Rights Division at the federal level. Does it raise civil rights concerns when the government attempts to intimidate citizens who are exercising their First Amendment freedom of speech? Um, thank you, Senator. Uh, we do not want intimidation in our society. So it would concern you if there was an exercise against an individual's free speech, correct? The First Amendment is important, and we also do not want a society with intimidation. Did President Biden promise to keep the DOJ apolitical? He has, and Attorney General Garland has made clear his commitment to ensuring that okay. partisanship will not impact our enforcement work. Okay, yes or no. Did the teachers union write a letter to DOJ asking you to use the Patriot Act to target concerned parents who voice their opposition to the indoctrination of their children, yes or no? Um, th this is not a matter that the Civil Rights Division handled. I'm aware of the uh, memorandum okay. issued by the Attorney General, uh, which speaks to threats and intimidation that some uh, school officials have experienced in our country. And that's not activity protected by the, the First Amendment. So you're saying a parent going to a school board and expressing their dismay with CRT or with a mask mandate is not protected speech. Is that what you're saying? I believe the Attorney General's uh, memorandum deals with, with threats and uh, intimidation okay. and harassment. Let me ask you this then. 
did DOJ issue the directive to the FBI to target parents in direct response to this letter from the teachers union, yes or no? Um, again, this is not a matter that the division handled, but what I can tell you is that the Attorney General said that, quote, threats against public servants are not only illegal, they run counter to our nation's core values. Do you believe it's appropriate to treat parents as domestic terrorists for daring to ask elected school board members questions about what is being taught to their children? Um, Senator, while this is not a matter that the Civil Rights Division handled, this is a, a memorandum issued by the Attorney General. Uh, I know that the Department is committed to ensuring robust civil discourse. Do you see any difference in somebody being a concerned parent and going to a school board meeting and asking questions and then that individual being labeled a domestic terrorist and this being carried out by the FBI and the DOJ, is that not a problem or a concern to you? The um, Attorney General's memorandum is focused on, on threats, on intimidation. So do you see parents as a threat? I, do you I see don't. parents asking questions as a threat? Does DOJ see parents asking questions as a threat? because we've seen reports from teachers, parents, and other members of a private Facebook group in Loudoun County, Virginia, that have been accused of compiling a list of names of district parents who oppose critical race theory in order to track, back, and dox, track, hack, and dox them, or even intimidate them into self-censorship. Should these teachers and other members of this private Facebook group be pursued by the FBI as domestic terrorists as well. Um, Senator, free speech is a, a hallmark value. So it's free speech for teachers that want to track parents, but it's not free speech for parents that want to show up at a school board meeting and make their displeasure known and engage in public discourse because those parents, taxpayers, are paying the bill. For, for that. Let me ask you this. Uh, Attorney General Garland, I've seen reports of his family connection to Panorama Education over data harvesting and uh, holding data on students and having contracts with school boards. And we've had quite a bit of discussion about Facebook and the way they market and data mine children as young as eight years old. Are you aware of that? Um, uh, this is not an issue that the Civil it's, Rights Division uh, okay, works so on, but I'm generally aware. You all work aware. in stovepipes, is what you're telling me, and that you have no knowledge or information about what is being done to parents and how they are being labeled, and this directive for the FBI to go and investigate parents who are standing up for what their children are being subjected to in some public school systems. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Uh, I, for the sake of everyone here, the circumstances on the floor are fluid and there's negotiations and conversations back and forth at the leadership level. The Democrat uh, leader is asking for a um, caucus immediately after the end of this first roll call, which is will be soon. So I would like, in fairness, to have two last witnesses before we recess, both of whom have been here before this announcement, clearly, Senator Coons and Senator Cruz. So I recognize Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, uh, and thank you, uh, Attorney General Clark. Um, thank you. Thank you for a lifetime of dedication to the Constitution, to voting, to finding a way where there seems to be now no way, to fighting for the foundation of our democracy, which is the right to vote. I have a, a picture on my iPad, and I'm smiling in this picture. I'm with Congressman John Lewis. I'm at the foot of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and I'm holding up a piece of legislation. It's a piece of legislation that then Chairman Leahy and I and our staff had worked tirelessly on over a year. 
and it was to fix the hole blown in the preclearance section of the Voting Rights Act by the Shelby County decision, a carefully balanced, sensible approach towards restoring the effectiveness of preclearance in the modern era uh, the way that it is in this bill. And in a minute, I'll just ask you to walk us through what that balance is that the now John Lewis Voting Rights Restoration Act would do. Um, but I have to say, I'm sick at heart. I was smiling that day because I was so hopeful and because I was in the presence of a living saint, someone who had borne the blows and given his own blood in a dozen places across our country, in a dozen instances, set upon by a howling mob when he was on a Greyhound bus as part of the Freedom Rides, attacked by a Klansman when he dared to stand up and speak for his rights, challenged by folks who spit on him or beat him or attacked him or jailed him. And yet in the time I got to spend with John on five different pilgrimages like this, both in our country and to South Africa, he struck me as one of the most generous, kind-hearted, humorous, um, spirited people. The thing that always um, challenged me about John was that he believed in America far long before America believed in him, that he grew up in a town that was struggling, sweltering under uh, racial oppression, and he never gave up hope. And I must confess there are moments now listening to my colleagues and the ways in which they are ignoring or mischaracterizing or maligning or misstating the work of the Department of Justice, the intention of this bill, that I am struggling to remain hopeful. And so I'll just say this. If John could remain hopeful, if Congressman Lewis could remain hopeful, oddly confident, supremely, even serenely at times, certain that in the end democracy would win out, so must we even at a moment when it seems so difficult, so even hopeless. And I will challenge my Republican colleagues to be true to the decades-old tradition of this Voting Rights Act, won by so much sacrifice, being reauthorized and reauthorized, improved and improved over decades, from 1965 to its most recent reauthorization, by negotiating together and finding a way forward. We have right in front of us a tremendous vehicle, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act could be the path forward for that next step towards a more perfect union. So if you would, um, we've heard today at this hearing objections that somehow subjecting certain localities to preclearance is fundamentally unfair. It's unfair to its citizens. It's an undue burden on their state sovereignty. But my recollection was as we first crafted it, this formula doesn't punish or shame any particular locality. It ensures voters within a jurisdiction with a demonstrated pattern of discrimination over 25 years are protected from a further erosion of their rights. And the formula permits a jurisdiction to emerge from preclearance after 10 years of a clean record. Can you just remind us briefly in the minute I've given you, Ms. Clark, how that preclearance framework balances local government prerogatives to manage and control their electoral arrangements and decisions with protections for that most important and foundation constitutional right, the right to vote. Thank you, Senator. If I may, I just wanted to share a recollection of uh, Congressman John Lewis. I recall him being on the Senate floor shaking the hands of many members of this body in 2006, uh, leading up to that 98 to zero vote in favor of reauthorization. I hope and believe that that level of bipartisan support for one of this body's most important federal civil rights laws remains possible today. Um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act contains a number of provisions. It contains a bailout provision that would allow jurisdictions with a clean bill of health a way to exempt themselves from the preclearance obligation. Judicial review is available to jurisdictions that want to bypass the Justice Department and instead proceed to court. Um, there's a long history of good and strong collaboration between the Justice Department and local and state election officials. The Justice Department has carried out its review of voting laws in 60 days or less. It's done so in a transparent manner, publishing guidelines that walk the public and officials through the process. 
that it, uh, it undertakes when reviewing uh, a voting law. Um, and we have heard from states like Mississippi and North Carolina that told the Supreme Court in the Shelby case that uh, DOJ is flexible and has latitude in how they handle the Section 5 process. So I think this bill, uh, uh, you know, again, makes clear um, that, that there is flexibility and, and latitude and respect for local and state jurisdictions that are administering uh, their local law. The goal is simply about uh, blocking and deterring discriminatory voting changes so that they would never take root in a community. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today, and um, thank you for your determined and capable leadership of the Civil Rights Division. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Coons. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Clark, when, when you testified before this committee and when Attorney General Garland testified before this committee, you both promised to be nonpartisan and impartial. I'm sorry to say that I think neither of you have lived up to that promise. Within weeks of President Biden being sworn in, the Department of Justice dismissed a Civil Rights Division lawsuit it had against Yale University for explicit racial discrimination. Yale has a policy that discriminates against Asians and Americans at admissions. It does so brazenly and openly. And yet, the Department of Justice decided that preventing racial discrimination did not fit within the purview of the Biden DOJ. Now, in your defense, you were not yet there, neither was Merrick Garland. So that was merely the initial political operatives of the Biden administration doing what they believed was consistent with the preferences of the president. But just this week, after you were there, after Merrick Garland was there, the Department of Justice issued a mem memorandum to the FBI instructing them to mobilize against parents across the country, parents of school kids, who have the temerity to show up at school boards and express their opposition to the teaching of critical race theory, a pernicious theory that divides us on racial lines, that tells school children the lie that America is fundamentally racist, that America is irredeemably racist, that all white people are racist. It spreads racial division. Many parents are understandably quite dismayed at schools that are teaching this to their children, sometimes as young as five. And yet the Department of Justice looked at that issue and decided to label the parents objecting to this teaching as domestic terrorists. Did you participate in discussions about the memo before it was issued? Um, Senator, I can't talk about internal deliberations. You can't talk uh, about whether you, you participated in discussions about the memo? No, but what I can tell you is that the Civil Rights Division will play a role going forward. The Attorney General has uh, uh, asked the Department to undertake a review, and the Division will participate in that review to determine how federal enforcement tools can be used to prosecute uh, crimes. Do, do, um, do you believe parents objecting to the teaching of critical race theory have civil rights in the democratic process? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't follow the question, Senator. You don't understand the question whether parents objecting to critical race theory have civil rights? The, the First Amendment is a core value in our democracy. And, I, I didn't um, say free speech. I said civil rights. School board meetings are democratic. They are petitioning your local government. Do they have civil rights that the voting rights gives a damn about? Yet they have the right to express their view, to uh, challenge uh, the school boards, to ask. And, and is it reforms. beneficial for the attorney general to label them as d domestic terrorists and direct the FBI to target them? The attorney general's memo deals with threats against public servants and says that threats against public servants are not only illegal, they run counter to our nation's core value. Do you believe parents objecting at school boards are domestic terrorists? I don't, Senator. Do you believe Antifa are domestic terrorists? Um, I, I, I don't have a view about Antifa. Do you believe the Black Lives Matter protesters who burned shops, who firebombed police cars, who murdered police officers, do you believe they're domestic terrorists? Um, Senator, I believe that we live in a society where people espouse different views, but what we don't want are threats You know, Ms. Clark, it is amazing that you're not willing to condemn people who are murdering police officers and firebombing cities because your politics aligns with them, 
But at the same time, when it comes to parents at school boards, you're perfectly comfortable with calling a mom at a PTA meeting a domestic terrorist. Ms. Clark, with all due respect, this demonstrates why the Democrat proposal to take someone with as long a partisan record as you have and to put you in charge of striking down any voting rights law in the country that you disagree with is nothing but a partisan power grab. Let me, let me give another example, because your division has operated in a purely partisan way. Uh, the Department of Justice dismissed the civil rights lawsuits against the state of New York, the state of Pennsylvania, the state of Michigan for those governor's policies that sent COVID positive patients into nursing homes, forces, forced the nursing homes to take those patients, a decision, a political decision that resulted in tens of thousands of deaths. One of those governors, Andrew Cuomo, has now resigned in disgrace and his staff had admitted they lied under reporting the deaths that policy caused. And yet your division dismissed the lawsuit against those Democratic governors. How are, are we to see that as anything other than a purely partisan decision? The, the letters that uh, were issued to officials in the uh, matters that you referenced were put together by career officials inside the department. That career officials can't be partisan? This department carries out its work free from political Are, are you testifying to this committee that there are no career officials in the Department of Justice who are partisan? Uh, partisanship does not impact the way that we carry out our Except enforcement Except miraculously, work. you dismiss the lawsuits against Democratic governors, even when their policies may have caused the deaths of tens of thousands of people. You also dismissed a lawsuit uh, that was brought against a medical center that had a pattern of discriminating against health care providers that, for conscience reasons, didn't want to implement abortions, even though clear federal law protects their civil rights. Why did you dismiss that civil rights lawsuit in, in contravention of federal law? Um, General Garland has made clear, and uh, I agree, that partisanship has no place in the enforcement of the Except every decision you make Justice is partisan. Department. Your actions contradict those statements. Your time has expired. We're going to stand in recess and subject to the call of the chair. I want to apologize to the witnesses on both sides. But this uh, caucus has been called at the last minute, and it relates to an issue, very timely issue, of the debt ceiling. So we will return, and uh, I ask you to stand at ease until that opportunity presents itself. The committee stands in recess.
one of the chief objections we hear about preclearance is that it imposes substantial burdens on state and local policymakers and election officials to wade through a bureaucracy before making innocent, legitimate policy decisions about how to run their elections. I'm sure you've heard that objection numerous times. Uh, we also hear that preclearance empowers activists, unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats at DOJ to make decisions at the expense of local officials. As the leader of the Civil Rights uh, Division, I'd like to give you a chance to respond to those criticisms. I know that I think they were raised before the break, and uh, I'm not sure that you've had a chance to respond to them in detail. I'd like to hear you on that score. Thank you, Senator. Um, the department finds that the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act contains a number of provisions that help ensure that the bill is truly focused and tailored on the current problems and current conditions in the country when it comes to voting discrimination. Uh, there is a bailout provision in the bill that would uh, make it easy for jurisdictions that have had a clean bill of health to exempt themselves from the preclearance obligation. Judicial review remains, remains available to jurisdictions that want to bypass the administrative process led by the Justice Department and instead go to the courts. Um, and there is a very long and deep history of collaboration between the career officials who administer Section 5 and the states and localities that routinely uh, make submissions. Um, the process is also fair and transparent. The department has published guidelines that outline for the public how the uh, Justice Department undertakes its section review obligation. Uh, and so in many respects, this bill is responsive to, to that concern, Senator. And by the way, just so everyone understands, the career attorneys in the Department of Justice are responsible to you as the head of the division, correct? That, that's correct, and they've undertaken this work for decades across both Republican and Democratic administrations. And they're accountable t to you, and you are accountable to the Attorney General, who in turn reports to the President of the United States, who is elected by the people of our country. That, that is correct, and most importantly, they undertake this work free from political interference and without any consideration of partisanship at all. Um, and uh, as, as you've just said, um, I understand that any jurisdiction that wanted to avoid the Department of Justice could seek preclearance directly from that's the district correct. court. So that's a kind of check and balance if you will. That's correct, Senator. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ms. Clark, for your continued service at the Department of Justice. Mitch McConnell says the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is, quote, unnecessary. According to him, it's already illegal to discriminate in voting based on race, so no one's rights are threatened. But Georgia just recently passed a law restricting voting access that targets voting by mail just after an election where, I don't think incidentally, voters of color relied on absentee ballots at unprecedented levels, and in the case of black and Asian voters at higher rates than white voters. When the preclearance provisions were established in 1965, was it not, Ms. Clark, precisely because ad hoc litigation proved too costly, time consuming, too easy to obstruct, too easy to delay for the Civil Rights Division to effectively prevent states and local jurisdictions from enacting voting policies that targeted voters of color. That's correct, Senator. And in many respects, we've turned the clock back because today we are uh, left to case-by-case uh, -case litigation to challenge voting discrimination that we continue to encounter. And the case-by-case -case litigation that we bring is 
costly, uh, time uh, intensive, resource intensive. Um, Section two, litigation under the Voting Rights Act has proven to be an inadequate substitute for the important prophylactic protections that had long been provided by Section 5. And in fact, by 1963, on the basis of the authorities that the Voting Rights Act of 1957 had afforded the Department of Justice, the department had filed 35 suits challenging either discrimination or threats against registration applications filed by black voters. As I believe you quoted in your testimony, then Attorney General Robert Kennedy said that those case-by-case -case suits were, quote, a painfully slow way of providing what is, after all, a fundamental right of citizenship, the right to vote. That, that is correct, Senator. And while we had Section 5 in place, between 1965 and 2013, the department blocked over 3,000 voting changes. 60% of those changes also had evidence of intentional discrimination. And so it's a remarkable and sweeping number of voting discriminatory voting changes that would have taken root but for the important protections that have been provided by Section 5. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Fueled by Donald Trump's big lie, threats against election workers skyrocketed during the 2020 election. In Georgia, election workers and officials at all levels, including the Republican Secretary of State and his staff, were harassed and targeted with death threats, as were members of their family. Polling places around the state received bomb threats from Atlanta to Jackson and Franklin counties in the Northeast to Floyd County in the Northwest and Bullock in the South. Election workers and election officials being able to work free from intimidation and threats is vital to free and fair elections. And that's why earlier this week I introduced legislation, the Election Worker and Polling Place Protection Act, to expand and strengthen protections for election workers, their families, polling places, and other election infrastructure. And I want to thank the chairman and my colleagues on this committee for swiftly including my legislation now in the full text of the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. My question for you, Ms. Clark, is do you expect that these threats against election workers and polling places may continue to grow in intensity and become more frequent? And why is it important that we strengthen federal protections for election workers and polling places in the law? Well, thank you, Senator. Um, Attorney General Garland recently convened a meeting of over 1,400 election officials across the country, a bipartisan group. Uh, we know that um, threats uh, harassment uh, of poll workers and election officials is an, a real issue. And uh, we also know that these individuals work tirelessly to run elections in our country. And Americans deserve a process uh, which is fair and open. And poll workers and election officials who conduct these elections in their communities deserve to be able to do their job free from harassment the Attorney General has convened an Elections Threat Task Force to deal with this issue, and the Department uh, welcomes the provisions of this bill, which would put in place important protections to counter this very real threat. Thank you, Madam Assistant Attorney General, for your testimony and your service, and Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> It's good to see you, Ms. Clark. Thank you for the work that you're doing. <clears throat> Last week, this committee held a hearing on the Supreme Court's use of the shadow docket to practically overturn Roe v. Wade by allowing Texas, Texas's unconstitutional abortion ban to take effect. But abortion isn't the only area where the Supreme Court has used the shadow docket to push its radical agenda. In the lead up to the 2020 election, the Supreme Court used the shadow docket time and again to restrict voters' access to the polls in Wisconsin, Alabama, Florida, among other states, each time claiming it was improper for courts to protect the right to vote so close to an election. 
Here are three Supreme Court shadow docket rulings that continue, as Justice Sotomayor put it, the court's, he quotes, trend of condoning disenfranchisement. In Republican National Committee versus Democratic National Committee, the Supreme Court, in a shadow docket by a five to four vote, overturned a district court's injunction that gave Wisconsin voters six extra days to receive and mail back absentee ballots, many of which had not been received because state authorities had been overwhelmed by record requests for such ballots due to the COVID pandemic. So the Supreme Court did not allow Wisconsin vo voters those six extra days. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was ast astounding because they were trying to use a deadline for returning those ballots or mailing the ballots that had not even been received. So that was pretty hard to explain in my view, but the Supreme Court in a five to four decision ruling did that. And Merrill v. Pers uh, People versus, uh, I'm sorry, People First of Alabama, the court stayed again by a five to four vote, a lower court order that sought to ensure that citizens with a high risk of contracting COVID-19 could safely exercise their fundamental right to vote. The district court preliminarily enjoined a pair of Alabama, Alabama laws that um, enabled persons in these situations to be able to vote so safely, but the Supreme Court said, nope. So the court's controversial conservative, I'm sorry, majority state that relief forcing high risk voters to risk their health in order to vote by mail. In Racer v. DeSantis, the court refused to vacate a stay of a lower court ruling that held unconstitutional Florida's scheme of disenfranchising, disenfranchising voters too poor to pay outstanding fines and fees. This is like a poll tax. So this was the shadow ruling that uh, Justice Sotomayor said it continues the trend of condoning disenfranchisement. So we know that uh, there are some 523 anti-voter bills that have been introduced in some 47 states this year alone. So Ms. Clark, can you think of any time when it's more important to protect voting rights than in the lead up to an election in an environment where hundreds of voter suppression bills are being introduced and where the Supreme Court is continuing its trend to disenfranchise voters. Would you like to talk a little bit about what we're facing and the importance of the kind of legislation we're contemplating? Um, thank you, Senator. The department has observed that since 2013, something has changed. The Supreme Court issued its Shelby ruling and we've started to see states and localities interpret the ruling as essentially a green light to move forward with discriminatory voting measures. Mm -hmm. The department has brought litigation in Texas and North Carolina uh, and currently has pending litigation in Georgia but this case-by-case -case approach has not proven adequate to uh, confront all of the voting discrimination that uh, we are up against. Uh, moreover, that case-by-case that -case approach is uh, time-intensive, uh, leads to long protracted litigation, and during the, the course of the litigation, the discriminatory voting measure is actually allowed to take effect and infects the electoral process. Our hope is that Congress will, will move quickly and swiftly to restore uh, the Section 5 preclearance process eight years after the Shelby ruling. And uh, I, I am running out of time, but the other case, of course, is the Branovich case, which made it hard to even bring a Section 2 case. And so the more recent Supreme Court case after Shelby just created, but basically I think that the Supreme Court decided to write its own law and set up some criteria that's not even in Section 2 uh, so that it makes it that much harder. And, and again, uh, the reason why we need to pass the kind of legislation we're contemplating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Hirono. Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, colleagues, when... Uh,
The Voting Rights Act was enacted in 1965. Voter registration rates for black Americans in the South were abysmal uh, up until that point because of the discriminatory laws and policies that made it effectively impossible for them to register. I point this out because largely because of the Voting Rights Act, things have undoubtedly improved since 1965. Indeed, more black voters were added to the rolls in the first two years following passage of the VRA than in the previous century. But significant barriers to ballot access remain, and some communities, particularly communities of color, feel the effects of these barriers more than others. After four decades of, and I want to underscore this, after four decades of overwhelming bipartisan majorities of Congress affirming the need for the Voting Rights Act with several reauthorizations and in reauthorizing, acknowledging the need for federal protection of the right to vote, including through preclearance, protecting the right to vote through preclearance. Uh, that happened repeatedly over the course of more than 40 years. But today, we find ourselves in a place where the Republican Party line is now that federal protection of the right to vote is tantamount to an unconstitutional federal takeover of state elections. My question, Ms. Clark, is this. In Shelby County, the Supreme Court struck down the coverage formula to determine which jurisdictions have to submit to the preclearance requirement. But has the Supreme Court ever held preclearance itself to be unconstitutional? Uh, thank you, Senator. No. Um, it essentially gave Congress the task to go back to the drawing board to fashion an approach to coverage that tethers the preclearance process to current conditions. And we know that Congress has been carefully studying this issue over the last few years, uh, developing a record that makes clear ongoing uh, voting discrimination remains rampant across the country. Uh, and it is not unusual uh, for Congress to respond uh, to a court ruling. Uh, we saw that with the Civil Rights Restoration Act and the Li Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. So the department welcomes this opportunity to work with you to update the coverage formula in response to the court's Shelby ruling. Because conditions have changed since 1965. Conditions have changed, Senator, but we know that voting discrimination remains no, I, I understand. Today. I, I, uh, at the risk of going off on a tangent here, because I think we can apply that logic even more strongly when it comes to the Electoral College, but that's a conversation for another day. Back on this topic. Uh, from a resource and uh, a timing perspective, I'll call it a damage done perspective, can you spend just a minute on the benefits of a preclearance requirement versus a post-enactment uh, litigation? Uh, well, Senator, uh, the burden on voters is undeniable. A discriminatory voting tactic may have taken root and infect the electoral process that's playing out in a community. We know that states have spent millions of dollars defending uh, suits. In Texas, they spent $3.5 million defending the discriminatory voter ID law. In North Carolina, more than $10.5 million spent uh, defending their omnibus bill uh, that the Fourth Circuit found discriminated with almost surgical precision. The Section 5 preclearance process is swift. It is easy. It is cheap for jurisdictions to comply with it. And it leaves Americans with the benefit of an electoral process that is free from discrimination. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I want to ask one more question on what may seem to some as not necessarily a, uh, a voting rights uh, element of this, but it is fundamentally one, not how people can cast their ballots, but um, as it pertains to the census and the redistricting process, which is pivotal from uh, a voting rights perspective. Census data shows that the Latino population growth uh, over the last decade fueled the population growth of states throughout the country. In California, for example, data shows that between 2010 and 2020, Latinos accounted for more than two-thirds of the state's population growth. 
places like uh, Texas similarly experienced significant growth of their Latino communities. Accounting for Latino population growth in redistricting is therefore critical to ensuring fair representation. But this redistricting cycle is unlike any other in the past five decades. For the first time since 1965, in light of the Supreme Court's decisions in Shelby County and Brnovich, states will conduct redistricting without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. So, Ms. Clark, my question is, what remaining tools does the Department of Justice have to help ensure a fair redistricting process, and how would the Department's efforts be enhanced by the passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act? Thank you, Senator. Uh, essentially, we would have Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act at our disposal, and this is not an adequate substitute for the important protections that had long been provided by Section 5. Uh, this case-by-case -case approach simply is not enough to stand up to the breadth and scope of voting discrimination that we see today. And if I may, I just want to underscore the importance of Section 5 when it comes to redistricting. The department had issued an ob objection in East Feliciana Parish, Louisiana in 2011 involving a proposed redistricting plan that would have reduced the black voting age population of a particular district. The department found evidence that the de demographer uh, in this uh, matter worked exclusively with white elected officials in coming up with a, uh, a plan uh, in which they redu it, it reduced the black population and increased the white population. Uh, and they excluded black elected officials in the course of drawing this map. This example illustrates the important role that Section 5 plays at the local level at the local count and county levels that are often uh, places that uh, are not under a microscope, but places where the department has found that voting discrimination has been rampant throughout the test of time. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Padilla. And uh, again, General Clark, I want to apologize for the interruption. It wasn't uh, planned, and uh, we had a rather important caucus. I hope you'll understand. Uh, you're certainly always welcome before this committee, and we thank you for your testimony today. Uh, and since there are no other senators seeking recognition at this point, you uh, may um, be dismissed, as I say. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank there, you, Senator. There may be written questions sent your way. Uh, we'll contact your staff if that's the case. Okay? Thank you. We're going to call the second panel, and um, I want to welcome Wendy Weiser, who directs the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU. She founded and directed the program's Voting Rights and Elections Project, directed litigation, research, and advocacy to enhance political participation and prevent voter disenfranchisement. We've also been joined by John Greenbaum, who serves as the Chief Counsel and Senior Deputy Director for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law, where he is responsible for overseeing the organization's legal project, including voting rights. And now, in a departure from custom and practice, I have been given the introductions of the two Republican witnesses. And um, so I'm, I'm going to give uh, the script that Senator Grassley would give without prejudice. I'd like to welcome our two witnesses to the Senate Judiciary Committee this afternoon. If we can connect up with him virtually, we're going to have the Attorney General of Indiana, Todd Rokita, and the Honorable Ken Cuccinelli. Mr. Cuccinelli, are you still with us? Or are you going to be with us virtually? I am, I am, I am Senator. Good, thank you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, Attorney General Rakita, are you on board yet? Well, we'll keep reaching out to his office. Let me say a few words about these two witnesses. The Honorable Ken Cuccinelli, currently National Chairman of the Election Transparency Initiative, <clears throat> decades of experience in government, acting Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Acting Deputy Secretary for the Department of Homeland Security during the Trump administration, leading spokesman for a variety of issues, including election security, served in the Virginia Senate from 2002 to 2010, and as the Virginia Attorney General from 2010 to 2014, he was the last uh, Attorney General of Virginia to handle the issue of preclearance. Welcome. Attorney General Todd Rokita, I hope you can join us. 
has a wealth of experience serving the Hoosiers in Indiana. He served as Attorney General since he was elected with the highest number of votes of any state office holder in Indiana last year. Prior to that, served in Indiana as 4th District Congressman from 2011 to 2019. He also served as Indiana Secretary of State from 2002 to 2010. While serving as the Indiana Secretary of State, he led the passage and implementation of the first in the nation voter ID law, which became a model. Following his success, 35 states followed suit, implementing similar laws to protect the integrity of our elections. So, first item of business is the swearing in of the witnesses. Could the witnesses present please stand and those at home uh, stand virtually? And I'm going to administer the oath. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you guys. Thank you. The record will yes. reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Senator Ossoff of Georgia is going to join me here in uh, a, m a moment and maybe presiding over part of this. But uh, we'll start with opening statements of five minutes, and the, and the first one we'll recognize is Wendy Weiser. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and Senators of this committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on strengthening the Voting Rights Act one of the foundational texts of American democracy and a critical bulwark against discrimination in our voting system. Unfortunately, as we've heard at length, in the last eight years, the Supreme Court has dealt two serious blows to the law, and it is simply no longer strong enough to protect Americans from increasingly aggressive voting discrimination. I thank Senators Leahy and Durbin for their exhaustive work in refining and updating the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. It couldn't come at a more critical time. The scale of the current assault on voting rights is staggering. At least 19 states have passed 33 laws this year, making it harder to vote, according to the Brennan Center's latest count. Many of these laws target voters of color, exacerbating persistent racial disparities in access. Turnout for non-white voters is now substantially lower than that for white voters and has been for over 25 years. And despite record voter turnout in 2020, only 58% of non-white voters participated compared to 71% of white voters. We are at the start of a redistricting cycle that is already showing signs of gerrymandering targeting communities of color. And an alarming wave of efforts to sabotage elections compounds these problems. Only Congress can solve this crisis. I will focus today on one aspect of the John Lewis Act, the geographic preclearance formula. The key point, it is new, updated, and laser focused. It is necessary because even though discrimination is now widespread, it is much more prevalent in some places than others. According to our count, there were over 120 voting rights violations over the past 25 years in the seven states likely to be covered under this bill for preclearance but fewer than 50 in the 39 states that are not close to coverage. Without preclearance, discrimination has become impossible to root out in these places. States have piled vote, voting restriction upon voting restriction, passing new ones as old ones are struck down in what amounts to legal whack-a-mole. For instance, the New Georgia and Texas vote suppression laws, the worst in the country, come after years of earlier voting hurdles in those states. States routinely devise devious new ways to discriminate in voting, what President Lyndon Johnson called ingenious discrimination when first enacting the Voting Rights Act. The geographic coverage formula has been updated and tailored with precision to meet current conditions following the Supreme Court's guidance. To ensure that the formula targets illegal discrimination, it relies on the best evidence established violations of voting discrimination laws. To ensure that it targets states with a persistent pattern of discrimination, it, it captures only those states that meet a high numeric threshold of violations over the past 25 years. And that 25 year review period is critical, ensuring enough time to identify where discrimination is persistent. And to ensure that it targets where discrimination is current, the review period is not frozen in time, but rolls forward. The duration of preclearance coverage is limited to 10 years, so jurisdictions without recent violations will automatically drop out, and they can easily bail out before then. 
Of course, stronger tools are needed to, to address discrimination in other places too. And that's why it's important that the bill also strengthens Section 2 and expands other national protections as well. As Justice Kagan observed in her recent dissent in the Brnovich case, this is a perilous moment for the nation's commitment to equal citizenship, an era of voting rights retrenchment. Safeguarding our democracy and protecting voting rights is one of the most sacred responsibilities this body has. The House has passed its bill, and it's now up to the Senate to act without delay to pass both the John Lewis Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Weiser. Uh, do we have Attorney General Rokita? Remotely? Okay, we're still waiting on Attorney General Rokita. Mr. Greenbaum, you may proceed with your opening statement for five minutes. Thank you to Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and the members of the committee for giving me the opportunity to testify today on ways in which Congress can restore and improve one of the nation's most important laws, the Voting Rights Act. It is vitally important that Congress pass the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2021 <clears throat> to remedy the damage to voting rights caused by the Supreme Court's decisions in Shelby County versus Holder and Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee. My written testimony goes into detail about a number of the provisions of the VRAA. For my oral statement, I'm gonna focus on two items in the Senate bill that amended section two of the Voting Rights Act. The first section two amendment addresses the Shelby decision by importing the retrogression concept from Section 5 into Section 2. This amendment to Section 2 would enable the United States or an aggrieved party to be granted the right to bring an action if a voting change is retrogressive. In other words, voting changes that worsen the voting opportunities of persons of color would violate Section 2. The retrogression cause of action provides an additional reasonable and necessary weapon in the fight against suppressive and discriminatory voting practices. It responds to current needs, which are not limited to those states and political subdivisions that may be subject to geographic coverage or at which attempt to implement practices known to be susceptible to discriminatory applications. And it would fill a gap because the Supreme Court has rep repeatedly made clear that the retrogression analysis under Section 5 and the Section 2 discriminatory results analysis are analytically distinct. This amendment is constitutional under the current fr framework set forth in Shelby County that the current needs for a law outweigh the current burdens. Regarding the current needs to voters, these modifications would serve. We have seen a proliferation of retrogressive voting changes that are often difficult and time consuming to challenge otherwise. Conversely, the constitutional burdens on jurisdictions is modest. Retrogression is a concept that the Supreme Court has found to be constitutionally acceptable and permitting plaintiffs to prove a case of discriminatory effect is standard under civil rights laws. Because the law would be national in application, the equal sovereignty principle set forth by the Supreme Court in Shelby County would not come into play. The second in the amendment in the Senate bill that I will discuss addresses the Brnovich decision and restores vote denial uh, results claimed under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to the pre-Brnovich standard that several cir circuit courts of appeals had adopted. When Congress amended Section 2 in 1982 to explicitly allow for discriminatory results claims, it did so as part of a legislative scheme to eradicate discrimination in voting. In the 1982 Senate report, Congress stated that Section 2 was intended to capture the complex and subtle practices that may seem part of the everyday rough and tumble of American politics, but are clearly the latest in a line of repeated efforts to perpetuate the results of past voting discrimination. 1986 in Thornburg versus Jenkels, the Supreme Court had said that the essence of a Section 2 claim is that a certain electoral law practice or structure interacts with social and historical conditions to cause an inequality in the voting opportunities enjoyed by black and white voters. Since Jingles, four different circuit courts addressing vote denial cases have used the foundation laid in Jingles to analyze these matters. This formulation distills Section 2 liability into a two-part test. One, there must be a disparate burden on the voting rights of minority voters. And two, that burden must be caused by the challenged voting practice because the practice interacts with social and historical conditions of racial discrimination. 
In answering the second question, the courts have used factors identified in the Senate's 1982 committee report. The Supreme Court decision in Brnovich provided guidelines for future treatment of Section 2 vote denial results cases that were not only new, but also contrary, or at least dilutive of, the decades-long accepted standards. My written testimony sets forth the various ways that the Brnovich decision uh, runs contrary to Congress's intent from 1982 that the VRA eliminate discrimination voting and how Congress should go about restoring Section 2 claims to the pre brnovich standard. The eight years since the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County versus Holder have left voters of color the most vulnerable of two discrimination they've been in decades. The record since the Shelby County decision demonstrates what voting rights advocates feared, that without Section 5, voting discrimination would increase substantially. The Brnovich decision, by creating new hurdles for Section 2 claimants to overcome, raises the stakes appreciably. Congress must act. Thank you for provi providing the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Greenbaum. Mr. Cuccinelli, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me today to discuss the quality and integrity of our voting systems. I'm Ken Cuccinelli. I served as Virginia's last Attorney General under the prior preclearance process. I currently serve as the National Chair of the Election Transparency Initiative, where we work every day to help improve the transparency, security, accessibility, and accountability of elections in every state so that every American has confidence in the outcome of every election, regardless of party or race, and regardless of whether one's chosen candidate won or lost. Today, it's easier to register and to vote than ever before in our history. Regardless of where you live, what color you are, or any political party you affiliate with, this is a great accomplishment worthy of celebrating while always looking to improve. Instead, many in this body seek to advance propaganda in place of truth. They accuse everyone who wants clean and transparent elections of the most despicable names or suggesting they want to suppress the votes of their fellow Americans. As evil as this, is this, as this course of conduct is, it is not new. It's been a long-term strategy. For example, in 2003, a New York Times editorial called election integrity a, quote, code phrase for voter suppression, unquote. That summarizes the false narrative very succinctly. The next year, in 2004, in Colorado, the DNC election manual suggested launching a, quote, preemptive strike by encouraging minority leadership to denounce voter suppression, issue press releases, and place stories when no signs of intimidation techniques have emerged yet, end quote. I wonder if the minority leaders being used in that way were told they were being used. In 2010, my former AG colleague, Martha Coakley, was caught red-handed in her losing Senate race practicing the tactic of preemptive accusation without evidence by issuing a press release alleging voting irregularities that had been drafted and dated the day before the election. Of course, her mistake was dating it the day before the election, unless you consider making up an accusation a mistake. In 2017, following the 2016 presidential election, the Democrats carried their false voter suppression narrative into court. But Obama appointed District Judge Vasquez rejected those claims, saying, quote, as far as what's before this court, you've presented me with no evidence of actual voter suppression efforts on the day of the election, much less tying it to the RNC. Quote, the DNC has a lot of resources, and I know this was a big concern. Where is the evidence that there was suppression going on on election day? and then a reasonable inference that the RNC was involved in those, end quote. And he found that there was none. More directly related to the history of the bill focused on here today, in 2019, Republicans offered to support that year's version of the bill if it included objective measures of voter suppression, such as low voter registration by minorities or low voter turnout by minorities but there was no interest in such objective standards on the left, and that offer was rejected. 
as that would not accomplish their actual goals of facilitating cheating nationwide. Not to mention, the worst performing states today under such objective standards would be states like Massachusetts and Oregon, not the states originally covered by the Voting Rights Act. The left advances this false narrative as a voter turnout message to rile up their base, period. As an example, in 2004, in an attempt to address the stated concerns of both parties, then RNC Chairman Ed Gillespie made a detailed proposal to then DNC Chairman Terry McAuliffe about how both parties could work together to address concerns about potential voter suppression and fraud thereby attacking any such problems and at the same time by working together, dramatically increasing the confidence of all Americans in the 2004 election. And I have put these two letters back and forth into the record. But consistent with the later discovered McAuliffe DNC strategy of intentionally making false accusations of voter suppression, as seen in the 2004 Colorado DNC manual, Terry McAuliffe and the DNC declined to work together to actually address even their own alleged concerns about voter suppression, presumably because their only interest was in the false narrative, as there was no longer a voter suppression problem to address, thankfully for America. I would also note the entire direction of this effort flies in the face of the Carter Baker Commission's recommendations the most comprehensive and bipartisan election analysis ever done. And with that, I'd appreciate the chance to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Cuccinelli. I understand that Attorney General Rokita has joined us remotely. Mr. Rokita, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Members of the committee for inviting me to speak to you today on uh, S4 and Given my experience both as Indiana's chief election officer and as attorney general, and even as with my experience as a candidate for both uh, federal and state elections, um, I know how elections can and should be run to ensure transparency and public confidence in them. Uh, in March this year, I was able to testify, testify before the Senate Rules Committee on Senate Resolution 1. And I'm here today to share uh, with Americans and Hoosiers about how S4 now seeks to achieve the same ends as S1, which is simply a partisan power grab of our election, but really it accomplishes this left-wing agenda through different means. Now S1 mandated states to adopt, among other things, early voting, automatic voter registration, no fault absentee ballots, basically live balloting, while also prohibiting protective measures such as state voter ID laws and voter list maintenance laws meant to clean up the names that shouldn't be on those lists. It sounds, sounds okay, but it really, uh, without the balance of the accountability and the access, uh, you don't have confidence in the election and you don't have, you know, right results a lot of the time. So now S4 would allow the Biden and Justice Department to assert the authority states rightly possess over their own elections by resurrecting and expanding the Voter Rights Act to places it never should be. And both S1 and now S4 seek to do the same thing, place power over local elections in the hands of partisan, unelected bureaucrats in Washington. And I happen to know bureaucrats in Washington haven't been in Congress. So what does S4 do? Uh, this partisan legislation creates new federal preclearance requirements for certain election reforms, voter ID or common voterless maintenance, for example, to be cleared by a partisan Department of Justice. The simple fact is S4 is a partisan power grab that erodes trust in our electoral system. This legislation is not honest. It's a politically motivated effort to circumvent the will of the American people, undermining their confidence in our elections. Unfortunately, the Biden Justice Department, seeking more power as a self-declared federal election czar, has already signaled they will seek unlimited authority over state elections. I note this because this is the same partisan Department of Justice that would be given unnecessary, unconstitutional, and nearly unlimited power over the state elections if S4 were to become law. So I'll quickly run through the top five issues uh, that I see with this legislation. And it's outlined further in my written testimony, which was submitted yesterday. 
The Constitution reserves for the states the primary role of establishing the time, manner, and place of holding elections for senators and representatives, U.S. senators and representatives only. S-4 seeks to flip this constitutional mandate on its head, turning the Department of Justice into a strengthened federal election czar, wielding the power to challenge any new or existing election law based on the whims of the party in power, whoever controls the Justice Department. And that should never be. It is important to note that states create laws based on what works best for their jurisdiction, most recently to respond to a crisis of confidence in our election system, like several states have done and several more will do. Why? The principles of federalism seek, seek to give voters the most impact possible in their elections and policy outcomes. You can't do that with an unelected election czar that the Just Department of Justice proposes to be. S-4 seeks to reinstate and expand outdated portions of the Voting Rights Act. When the VRA was enacted in 1965, federal oversight over state election laws was necessary to combat discrimination in some jurisdictions, physical, in access to polling places, uh, other gross uh, barriers to the ballot box that we have, we have overcome. The original intent was to ensure that the rights of Americans were not infringed upon at the ballot box based on their race. And that has been accomplished for decades now. Thankfully, the VRA did exactly what it was intended to accomplish, like I said. However, instead of acknowledging these developments, S-4 looks backwards to the condition of 19, conditions of 1965, not the current conditions that exist in 2021. I've never seen a bill or frankly a party that looks backwards so much in order to keep themselves relevant. The U.S. Supreme Court recognized in Shelby, not the case, that this dramatic change, noting how widely accessible voting is today. So there's nothing to see here, and they're right. That court was correct. Proving this point, the aggregate effect since Shelby shows black and Hispanic voters are participating at higher rates, the highest it's been. S4 dramatically lowers the burden of proof for plaintiffs in vote denial and vote dilution claims under Section 2 of the VRA. S4 encourages courts to consider subjective factors in vote denial claims and dilution claims that weigh heavily in favor of plaintiffs and are unpreventable by election officials. Most shockingly, S4 pressures judges to consider the factor of whether a jurisdiction uses photo ID requirements for voting and analyzing vote denial claims, directly attacking the Supreme Court standard in the Crawford case, the case that I was a part of when I was Indiana Secretary of State. However, without the photo ID requirements and other similar security measures, legal citizen voters are disenfranchised by the fraud and illegal voting that will result in dilute legal citizen vote. You know, voter fraud goes both ways. S4 focuses on vote dilution of protected uh, minorities, but it does nothing to address vote dilution of legal voters and fails to take any real action against illegal voting. S4 excessively expands the coverage formula with potential to subject numerous states to pre-clearance requirements, draconian and unneeded at this stage of our democracy. State laws stand in jeopardy over, over mere preliminary judgments and consent decrees. To this point, S4 requires, quote, practice-based, unquote, preclearance for certain election laws in all 50 states, not just the states subject to the new coverage formula. If states enact election laws within any of these areas, such as voter ID requirements, voting locations, redistricting, or maintenance of voter registration lists, the reform is automatically subject to the preclearance process, unfair and unneeded and unconstitutional. All practices having to be approved by a partisan justice department allowing politically appointed bureaucrats to meddle in the elections of state. It's not right. And I'll end with this. S4 would interfere with the state's legislature's ability to protect their voters and the integrity of the election process in direct violation of the United States Constitution. In 2005, a bipartisan commission headed by former President Carter and Secretary of State James Baker recognized the existence of in-person voting fraud and endorsed a photo identification requirement. Few would say that President Carter is any kind of conservative, yet he endorsed it. In the wake of these endorsements, states like Indiana began passing voter ID laws, and over a decade ago, 
the Supreme Court upheld Indiana's voter ID law, a common sense and non-discriminatory protection for our elections in our free republic. While serving as Indiana Secretary of State, I led the passage and then implementation of the first in the nation voter ID law. Indiana's voter ID law became a model for the nation. Our voter turnout went up. And since then, because of that, 35 states have followed suit in enacting laws to protect the integrity of our elections. Indiana has seen no as applied challenges to our voter ID law since the US Supreme Court upheld our law. It is constitutional, it is common sense. Yet S4 would still likely put Indiana in a preclearance status due to its overreach and litany of reasons why the Federal Department of Justice would claim the need for preclearance review. S4 gives partisan bureaucrats in the Justice Department the power to veto those exact common sense protections. So here's the bottom line. S4 is a clumsy and heavy handed partisan effort to circumvent the will of the people. Earlier this month, 22 of my attorney general colleagues joined me in a letter to congressional leadership opposing this very legislation. And if S4 were to become law, I am prepared to seek all legal remedies possible to protect the constitution, the sovereignty of all our states, our elections, and the rights of American citizens and Hoover. And I'm confident other states are gonna join. Americans know there must be confidence in our election process, it's common sense. Yet partisan proposals such as this, or any federal power grab, seek to undermine further the American people's trust in our elections. Let's not do this. We don't need to do this. We shouldn't do this. The American people will not allow this radical power grab to move forward, and I'm gonna be on their side. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rokita. And thank you to all of the witnesses for joining us today. Thank you to Senator Durbin and Senator Leahy for your tireless work to advance this legislation. Congressman John Lewis was my mentor for nearly 20 years. And for those of us from the state of Georgia, for all Americans, for people around the world, he represents the very best of public service and self-sacrifice in advancing civil rights, voting rights, and human rights. And it was on March 7th, 1965, in Selma, Alabama, when Congressman Lewis and Hosea Williams and Maria Boynton and hundreds of others marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, into a storm of violence. And Congressman Lewis that day had his skull fractured for daring to demand equal access to the ballot for black Americans in the American South. That was March 7th, 1965. And inspired and motivated by the example of John Lewis and the others who gave so much that day, just 10 days later, the Voting Rights Act was introduced in the United States Senate. And it was signed into law by President Johnson on August 6th, 1965 thanks to the sacrifices of patriots like John Lewis. In 2013, the Supreme Court invited the United States Congress to update this vital voting rights statute. And so thanks to the efforts of Senator Durbin and Leahy and so many others, we are here to restore and strengthen the Voting Rights Act, to recommit to protecting voting rights and ballot access for voters in Georgia and across the country, no matter the color of their skin. It is essential that we pass this legislation. And at this time, I would yield to Senator Durbin for his questions. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. Um, I, I just want to say at the outset that I listened to the comments made by the Indiana Attorney General and Mr. Cuccinelli. And I thought to myself, these are echoes of the same arguments that we have always heard. Leave it to the states. Things will turn out just fine. History tells us otherwise. History tells us that unless we carefully guard the right to vote for every American, some will tend to exploit that situation. Ms. Weiser, in your testimony, you talk about the findings of Professor McCrary staggering 143 violations over the last 25 years in the 
eight states likely to be covered by the 2019 formula, another 32 violations in three states, three states that were close to meeting the coverage requirements. It suggests that there is still a challenge that the Supreme Court didn't get it right in Shelby. Is there evidence to back up the fact that we still are facing threats that go to the heart of a person's civil rights in America? Thank you very much for that question. And absolutely, yes, there is overwhelming evidence in the record before this Congress of an ongoing, persistent, and growing threat of discrimination, um, threatening the right to vote of, Amer of, of many, many Americans. Um, I, I mentioned already that we are facing a huge surge in legislative efforts to restrict access to voting across the country, and this is actually the biggest legislative push since Reconstruction. We are also seeing um, a, an increase in successful litigation across the country as these jurisdictions are piling voting restriction upon voting restriction. These are precisely the reasons why the Constitution gives Congress the power under the 14th and the 15th Amendments to protect the right to vote from discrimination, to, uh, to put in place prophylactic measures to deter and remedy discrimination in voting and to enforce the Constitution's guarantee of equal voting rights. Mr. It Greenbaum, you've heard the statements that have been made by two of the other witnesses at this panel. And it seems to me to be an echo of the argument of states' rights, which has been used historically uh, and, and as a justification for discrimination, or at least for the government to, federal government to take its hands off of state matters. It, it's a recurrent theme. Is, is there any more validity today than there has been in the past? Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Senator. And if you want to talk about the progress that has been made the last several decades, actions by Congress have been a critical part of that. Um, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, but I wouldn't leave it there. Um, Mr. Cuccinelli referred to the increases in, in voter registration, how it becomes easier to register to vote. Well, why is that? The National Voter Registration Act, which Congress passed in 1993, enabled and put a floor and put some requirements that states had uh, that states had to implement with giving people increased voter registration opportunities, including to being able to vote to register to vote uh, at driver's license offices, at public assistance offices, et cetera. And with respect to voting discrimination, which the Voting Rights Act covers, um, we've seen the void in the last eight years after after Shelby County in terms of what states have done to discriminate against voters of color. In states like Georgia, for example, uh, you have a demographic change going on in Georgia. In 2004, whites were 67% of the registered voters. Today, whites are 53% of the registered voters. And what is happening is as voters of color in Georgia are able to assert more power at the ballot. You're seeing actions by the Georgia legislature to make it more difficult, particularly for voters of color, to participate at the ballot box. Let me say this in closing with the last 30 seconds here. We should never tolerate any fraud, voter fraud, or abuse of our electoral system by either party or any candidate, mm -hmm. period. But I will tell you that we have scant, if any, evidence of voter fraud that would justify some of the actions that are being asked by some of these uh, activists on the other side. Time and again, when they spend thousands, even millions of dollars as in Arizona, it turns out to be a joke. Looking for bamboo fivers, for God's sake, in the ballots and whatever else they were up to, turned out they found more votes for Joe Biden than the official count initially. Uh, this voter fraud excuse is no reason, unless they can clearly prove it and in, in most cases, they're not even close. I yield, Mr. President. Thank you, Chair Durbin. Ranking Member Grassley, you're recognized for five minutes. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to start with Mr. Rokita because he, uh, I'm told he has to go. So you wrote a letter on September the 13th to congressional leadership. I quote, if passed, uh, H.R. 4 would resurrect and enact new federal preclearance requirements 
in jurisdictions targeted for litigation by activist groups. What is the danger of moving away from the vote denial factor set forth in Brnovich uh, in favor of the focus on litigation tactics? And the second part of the question, please tell us about your experience with activist groups and others uh, and how these groups could use litigation tactics to successfully force select states into preclearance. Thank, Thank you, Senator. Senator. Um, the Brnovich case offered several factors to consider for future courts to consider or future courts to consider in vote denial claims. So the usual burdens of voting, you know, are legitimate. That's what they found and reaffirmed. How long an election procedure has been lawfully and historically used, whether identical or similar election procedures are used by other jurisdictions, the availability or alternative means of voting and the state's interest in preventing fraud. So S4 factors uh, will make it challenging for future plaintiffs to win vote denial cases under its Section 2, as I understand it. And S4 unabashedly prohibits courts from considering common sense factors that have been outlined by the Supreme Court now for a long time. So the enumerated factors in S4 to determine whether a violation occurred are completely subjective and they're unreasonable. So you're, you're basically allowing an election czar to, if he li like it was said, I think, by Senator Cruz and maybe others, if that elections are likes you, maybe you're a liberal, you know, because you're a liberal state, well, then you're going to be okay. If it doesn't like you in their own discretion, they get to decide if you need to be uh, precluded. <laughs> and then these activist groups drive up costs for the states. They, they browbeat, they force, sometimes they collude with other elected officials, maybe in a state, maybe elsewhere, to, uh, to force, embarrass, out of fear, out of out of intimidation, whatever, uh, to enter in to a consent decree, and and again, it's violative of the U.S. Constitution, where our founders said time, manner, and place is to be decided by the states, and we have the primary role. Thank you for that answer. I'm going to go to Cuccinelli, uh, and I think I know the answer that nothing in H.R. 4 would uh, bother what we are very jealousy guarding in Iowa, both for Republicans and Democrats, to be first in the nation caucus status. But I'm going to ask it anyway, is there anything in this bill that might impact that? Well, well certainly the expansive reading that, we're, that I would expect to see uh, from a Biden-Harris DOJ and led by Kristen Clark, who you heard from earlier, uh, would not simply deal with general elections. They will certainly wade into primaries. And primaries can historically, I uh, think of the Jayhawk case, uh, be, be discriminatory. They, so we have to guard against discrimination in those nominations as well. And the authority granted to the Department of Justice under this bill, you can fully expect to play a role. One of the complaints about Iowa and New Hampshire being early in the calendar for each of the parties is that they are more white than the nation as a whole. Well, under this uh, legislation, um, those are two states that were not under the Voting Rights Act uh, previously, the preclearance meaning, uh, that would be subject to preclearance. And I would extend Attorney General Rokita's comments to say those outside activist groups can simply target these two states with litigation. And the occurrence of litigation um, can be a basis to be brought into preclearance. Um, Mrs. Weiss's comment that the best evidence um, is violations might be true if it were limited to violations, but that is not the standard in this bill. And I would note that the Democrats rejected the ultimate goal being the standard, the goal being minority voter turnout and registration. That was rejected as an ongoing standard on their part. And it gives away the fact that this is a partisan powder, power grab, not an attempt to solve a problem with minority voting. Uh, you were attorney general uh, with preclearance before it was outlawed by Shelby. Could you talk to us about the standards for preclearance that were in place for uh, Virginia then versus the standards that would force Virginia into preclearance if H-4 were passed? That's my last question. So, so, Senator, Senator uh, preclearance as it existed pre-Shelby 
Um, you know, you go back to 1965, it certainly was needed and required. I grant you that entirely. And it worked as the Supreme Court found. But as it continued on and up to 2013, um, there's no question the burden was quite significant. Pre-clearance for those states meant pre-clearance of everything. If you moved a polling place, if you moved within a school for where you voted, you had to get that pre-cleared by the federal government. And each of those opportunities, as the federal government would view it, is an opportunity to bend your state's election system to the will of those in the Justice Department. And even the President Obama's inspector general found that the voting section was uh, hiring those from the radical left. They were predominant even back then. And you've heard the commitments by Attorney General Garland you can fully expect that trend to get worse. So the, the place where these questions will be judged is not an objective set of professional career lawyers. These are literally the most rabid left-wing partisan lawyers you could find in the federal government. Thank you, Ranking Member Grassley. Ms. Weiser, in the Shelby County decision, did not the Supreme Court expressly invite Congress to update the pre-clearance formulas? That is absolutely correct. Um, and Ms. Weiser, can you address how the pre-clearance coverage formula and other provisions in the John Lewis bill as introduced this Congress are carefully crafted to encompass the state's localities and voting practices that pose the greatest threat of voter discrimination, avoiding either over-inclusion or under-inclusion, please. Yes, thank you for your question, absolutely. Um, as I noted, the states come into preclearance based on their actions, actual proven violations of the law against race discrimination in voting. It is not based on things in 1965. It is current and ongoing and rolls forward. Um, it is um, not the case that um, these are just mere lawsuits. They actually have to result in either judicial findings or admissions of liability or consent decrees, which are actually entered by courts and actually require courts to consider the strength of the plaintiff's case and whether it is, um, and the finding is fair. That in addition, it is tailored to get jurisdictions that not only have proven violations, but that have a persistent pattern of violations over a long period of time. And it is tailored also by limiting the coverage period and offering very easy bailout to ensure that jurisdictions will not stay covered if they haven't had violations within the last decade. And I will add, it is not partisan officials within the Department of Justice. It's, it's not just that it's career officials. It is also the jurisdiction can choose whether or not they want to go to the Department of Justice or to um, a federal, the three-judge federal court to submit their preclearance request. Thank you, Ms. Weiser. Mr. Greenbaum, the John Lewis bill includes a critical provision that under Section 2 would allow the Attorney General the opportunity to challenge changes in voting practices anywhere in the country that diminish voting rights for voters of color. I'm referring to what's known as the retrogression provision of the bill. Why is this retrogression provision so important? How does it differ from existing Section 2 authorities? And how is it different from retrogression under preclearance? Sure. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, the, the concept of retrogression is one that, through Section 5, we're quite familiar with uh, in terms of how to actually apply retrogression. And in basic terms, what it means is, does the law make things worse for voters of color? Which is a much more straightforward test than the existing results test under Section 2, which requires a number of factors, um, and it and takes longer time to litigate and are, and are harder cases to resolve. So retrogression itself is a much more simple concept. It's one that the Supreme Court has signed off on uh, through Section 5. In fact, the Supreme Court in the Beer case largely created the standard of retrogression. Uh, re the retrogression under Section 2 would be different than under Section 5 in that it would cover all areas of the country. So it would not be limited to 
uh, particular places. It would not be limited to particular types of voting changes. It could apply to any voting change anywhere in the country. Uh, it would, unlike Section 5 preclearance, require the plaintiffs, whether they be the Department of Justice or a private party, to go into court and prove to a federal judge that a particular voting change um, puts uh, voters of color in a worse position than before. And what we've seen with a lot of the laws that have been passed this year, uh, including in your state, uh, Georgia, uh, a number of the changes appear to be clearly retrogressive, such as changes that uh, make it more difficult for people to vote by mail. And what we saw in 2020 is, is that black voters and Asian voters in particular were the ones who voted by mail the most frequently, as well as limitations on the use of drop boxes, which again, voters of color use in, in a disproportionate number. Um, and it, it creates a clear, easy to administer, uh, or at least easier to administer standard for the federal courts to follow. Thank you, Mr. Greenbaum. Senator Klobuchar is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, let me start with you, Mr. Weiser. Uh, Justice Ginsburg's dissent in Shelby County noted that the Constitution uses the words right to vote in five separate places, the 14th, 15th, 19th, 24th, and 26th Amendments. Each of these amendments contains the same broad empowerment of Congress to enact appropriate legislation, that's the Constitution words, to enforce the protected right. The implication is unmistakable. Under our constitutional structure, Congress holds the lead reign in making the right to vote equally real for all U.S. citizens. Can you explain why time and time again the Constitution recognizes a role for the federal government? And why is it that Congress and not state legislatures is entrusted with making the right to vote equally real for all U.S. citizens? Thank you Thank for you, that Ms. question. Weiser. Thank you. It is absolutely the case that the Constitution empowers Congress to make real the guarantee for the right to vote against discrimination. The Constitution also grants Congress broad powers over to regulate federal elections, to even to create an entire code of voting for federal elections, as Justice Scalia the late Justice Scalia recently affirmed under the Constitution's Elections Clause. One of the main concerns that the framers of the Constitution had was that um, voting rights, and in, including um, elections for federal elections, um, would be manipulated by um, factions and partisans at the state level who might try to disenfranchise or engage in practices like gerrymandering. And under the 14th and 15th Amendment, which grow out of a, um, uh, the unfortunate um, history of brutal slavery and disenfranchisement of large swaths of the population of black Americans, it was, the state, it was Congress that um, took the reins to actually um, to, to enforce equality after the brutal Civil War. It was states were not trusted to, with that. Very good. Um, I know in your testimony, Ms. Weiser, you mentioned the Freedom to Vote Act, which I appreciate. Uh, you noted in your testimony to the committee that Section 2 cases are extremely time consuming and resource intensive, uh, which you experienced as a litigator at the DOJ. Taking proactive steps like Section 5 of the VRA's pre-clearance formula is an important measure to prevent voter suppression laws from ever having to be litigated in a courtroom. Um, that is one of the reasons uh, why, Chair of the Rules Committee, we worked on the Freedom to Vote Act, uh, which sets these basic national standards. Um, could you talk about why it is important to pass both the John Lewis Bill and the Freedom to Vote Act in order to uh, pro proactively prevent discriminatory laws from being enacted, as well as put some basic federal rights into law. Um, absolutely. The preclearance requirement has long worked to, or before the Shelby County decision, was the most successful provision at actually stopping 
um, the worst discriminatory, discriminatory measures from going into place in the jurisdictions with the worst histories of discrimination. It stopped them in their tracks before they were put in place. But that was only for new voting changes and the rest of the country where there, weren't, um, where there wasn't that same history of discrimination had to rely on Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. As you note, it, um, bringing case-by-case -case litigation is time-consuming, expensive, slow, and while it is pending, discriminatory measures can continue and go into effect. What the For the People Act also does and is puts bright line standards, a set of rules that every American can rely on, regardless of race, um, for, and, and that can't be manipulated for discriminatory or partisan reasons. It's much easier for courts to enforce and administer because they are clear and don't require this multi-part inquiry. And together, these bills work to um, fill the hole and meet the crisis that we're facing today in voting rights in America. Very good. My last question, uh, Mr. Greenbaum, I actually was quoting you, but she also mentioned it, Ms. Weiser mentioned it in her opening. You want to comment on the, what I just asked Ms. Weiser? Uh, sure. Um, you know, what we've really what we've seen since Shelby County um, is an incredible proliferation on uh, d discrimination against people of color in terms of voting, beginning with the day that Shelby was announced when uh, the Attorney General of Texas, where their voter ID law had been um, prevented from going into place under Section 5, said, okay, we're gonna intervent, we're gonna move forward with that voter ID law and we spent this, the next several years, um, my organization, Ms. Weiser's, Department of Justice, other organizations, uh, going to court to get that law struck down, that it was discriminatory under, under the Voting Rights Act. Um, ultimately, you know, getting a Fifth Circuit en banc decision uh, in our favor. And you know, then we went for our fees. And the Fifth Circuit in the last month affirmed our fee award of $6.8 million. And we know that Texas spent at least $3.5 million on that lawsuit. So we spent several years litigating, um, finally block preventing that law from going into effect, which affected people during those three, three years in between. And ultimately between, uh, ultimately, ultimately it's gonna cost the state of Texas more than $10 million for moving forward with that discriminatory law. Very good point, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Hirono, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it's not a coincidence that shortly after Shelby County, uh, some 13 states passed voter suppression laws and now with the conservative majority firmly ensconced in the Supreme Court with three Trump justices. We are seeing dozens of voter suppression laws being enacted supposedly to prevent widespread voter fraud, which has not been shown to be the case at all. So earlier I noted three Supreme Court shadow doctrine, shadow docket rulings that continue the court's trend, as Justice Sotomayor put it, of condoning disenfranchisement by the court. So Ms. Weisner, Weiser and Mr. Greenbaum, do you agree with Justice uh, Sotomayor's uh, dissent, noting that the, the court is condoning disenfranchisement? Thank you for that question. We, the courts play, continue to play a critical role in protecting voting rights for all Americans. But unfortunately, it is the case that the Supreme Court has consistently rolled back the strength of voting rights protections, making it much harder for litigants, voters, to enforce those rights, and seems to be um, portending that there might be more to come. That is why it is absolutely critical for Congress to step in and protect voting rights. The court has actually said that Congress has broad powers to enact legislation to protect Americans' voting rights, and where the court is not um, fulfilling its obligation, Congress can really um, uh, meet that constitutional obligation for uh, America. And I, and I absolutely uh, agree with that. Um, 
we've seen uh, a number of times, including the, the cases you cited, um, Senator Hirono, um, as well as the, the decisions that we've been talking about, Shelby and, and Brnovich. Um, one of the things that I find especially disturbing about the Brnovich case is it clearly flies in the face of congressional intent by uh, the court's decision in that case, adding a whole new set of factors mm -hmm. that courts are supposed to consider that are nothing, that none of that appears in the statute itself. None of it appears in the congressional history in 1982, and it flies in the face of, of, of what, this, what this body did in 1982 to try to eradicate discrimination voting. It actually, um, there are aspects of that decision that, that s seem to almost encourage jurisdictions to move forward with mechanisms that are discriminatory. Uh, so, it, so it's a tremendous concern. Thank you, That's Senator exactly Rona. what happened. In fact, Justice Alito, who uh, is a justice who uh, signals certain things, such as he'd like to revisit uh, um, Obergefell, for example. So there he is, writing in, in that case, which I found astounding because he creates, I think he writes laws, he creates what he calls a non-exhaustive list of guideposts for Section 2 cases, including uh, the size of the burden imposed by a challenge voting rule, the degree to which a voting rule departs from what was standard practice when Section 2 was uh, amended in 1982, uh, the size of any disparities in a rule's impact on members of different racial or ethnic groups, the opportunities provided by a state's entire system of voting when assessing the burden imposed by a challenge provision, and the strength of the state interest served by a challenge voting rule and requiring courts to compare the voting restrictions being challenged in a Section 2 case to the burdens of voting as existing in 1982. My gosh, I, I, I find this case to be completely astounding. And talk about uh, judicial activism. So I can see where Section 2 cases were, uh, was made even harder after this decision and why we need the legislation that we're talking about. When we talk about some of the kinds of voter suppression laws that have been enacted by the uh, states, I think sometimes we don't understand quite how, with surgical precision, some of these voter suppression laws are. Mm -hmm. So Ms. Weisner, uh, can you uh, give a, a specific example of a voter ID law, for example, that is surgically targeted so that it makes it a lot harder for black voters, for example, to vote? Yes, thank you. Um, and as you note, um, the inquiry into voter ID laws, it is not whether or not all voter ID laws are um, discriminatory. Mm -hmm. yes. It is a case-by-case -case examination based on the actually particular design of the law. And some of the laws are very clearly both intended to discriminate based on race and are designed very clearly to do so. Um, one that comes to mind is in North Dakota, there was a voter ID law that required a residential address on the, um, uh, on the identification itself, despite the fact that 19% of the Native American citizens in North Dakota lived on reservations without residential addresses, and they tried to change that, but it was, you know, that, that was found to be intentionally discriminatory. The Texas voter ID law that Mr. Greenbaum referred to was found to be intentionally discriminatory by um, the district court and was ultimately found to be, um, to have a discriminatory result, and it, um, surgically chose um, um, identification um, so as to have that impact. So it famously included concealed carry licenses as acceptable forms of ID, but not um, state employee IDs or state um, university IDs, which were disproportionately held by black and Latino voters in Texas. And those legislatures that are enacting these kinds of laws know very well whose votes they are suppression, suppressing, and that is why they're doing it. And uh, I think it's just so nefarious. I can, uh, it's just, you know, voting is a fundamental right. And uh, I, I am a naturalized US citizen, and, and one of the first things I did when I turned 18 was to vote, because I considered that, that so foundational and fundamental, and we should do everything we can to make sure that 
that everyone can exercise their right to vote. Thank you very much for what you are doing uh, with the, at the center. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hirono. Seeing no other senator seeking recognition, uh, I'll, in closing, just ask each one more question. In the Shelby County v. Holder decision, again, the Supreme Court, as you affirmed in your testimony, Ms. Weiser, expressly invited the United States Congress to update the coverage formulas necessary for the Department of Justice to execute its authorities under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. We have mm -hmm. taken that seriously and done that work, and based upon the evidence, we have drafted those updates. They are included in this legislation. And it is, my, in my view, vital that we restore those vital protections for American voters. My question, beginning with you, Ms. Wisner, if we in the United States Congress do not use the authority that we have under Article I, Section 4 and the 14th and 15th Amendments to protect ballot access by enacting this legislation, what do you see for the future of voting rights, especially for minority voters in the United States? Thank you for that question. Um, there's no question we are at a critical moment with respect to attacks on voting rights, with vote suppression, voting discrimination, even efforts to sabotage election results, um, achieving fever pitch, discriminatory redistricting abuses, and um, court rollbacks of rights. If Congress does not act, I fear that there's no question that this vote suppression is not only going to continue to pro proliferate, but that Americans of color are going to be disenfranchised in, in large numbers because of their race. And that is fundamentally at odds with the promise of our Constitution, of our democracy. Um, and this is something that Congress emphatically has the power and duty to stop. And, and I'll say that the, when preclearance was in effect beforehand, um, uh, as Justice Ginsburg noted famously in dissent in the Shelby County decision, it was working very well and uh, throwing away preclearance just because we're not seeing a, a spike in discrimination is like throwing away an umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Well, we saw what happened after um, the preclearance went away. We got very, very wet. There was a deluge of voting discrimination measures, and that has continued, and it's getting more brazen. So there is an urgency, and we strongly urge Congress to act quickly to pass this vital legislation, um, as well as the Freedom to Vote Act. Thank you, Ms. Weiser. Mr. Greenbaum? And I would, I would agree with, with my colleague. I, I mean, I think we're seeing the greatest attack on the right to vote since the Voting Rights Act was passed. And it's not surprising because you have this state of affairs where there's a big hole in the, in, in the enforcement power of the federal government and private parties to fight against voting discrimination. That you're seeing that because of this gap, it's, what you're seeing is you're seeing um, legislatures and others using this as an opportunity to introduce measures that are specifically designed to go after voters of color. And this is particularly true in those states where voters of color can make the difference in terms of who wins and who loses elections. I, you know, you're, we're, we're seeing these laws being proposed and enacted in certain states, but a disproportionate amount of the activity are in those states where voters of color really are exercising their opportunity to vote and can make a difference in who wins and who loses elections. And unfortunately, it's coming from a very cynical place. Uh, you know, it's really disturbing for me as a career uh, civil rights and voting rights lawyer to see sort of the cynicism that I think what you're seeing is you're seeing people putting um, putting their own interests ahead of the fundamental right to vote and being willing to do things that are in, in a lot of ways intentionally designed to make it more difficult for voters of color. And so it's absolutely cru critical, as Congress did in 1965, to go after eliminate, eliminating discrimination in voting. It's absolutely critical that Congress in 2021 fill that gap 
that the Supreme Court has created and enact legislation that is gonna allow people to exercise their most fundamental of rights, and that's the right to vote. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Greenbaum. Thank you again to all the witnesses appearing before the committee today. Before we adjourn, I'd like to enter into the record a report from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights documenting voting conditions in states and jurisdictions previously covered under preclearance. This report covers New York, and that'll be entered in the record without objection. As referenced in the title of this hearing, my friend, Congressman John Lewis, and if you're a Georgian, an American, still feel his presence profoundly, though he's gone, and we have an obligation to live up to and honor his example. He said that the right to vote is, quote, precious, almost sacred. And I can think of no better way to honor the life and legacy of Congressman John Lewis as our country still mourns his passing last year than to restore the Voting Rights Act of 1965 for which he bled and nearly died to protect that precious, almost sacred right to vote. And the hearing is adjourned.